As always, you can click on the timestamp in the description or over here to skip this longish introduction. Today's theolocution involves Eric Weinstein and Mick West on the topic of the evidence of UFOs, as well as the relationship between skeptics, debunkers, disclosure, the public perception, and scientific inquiry. Eric Weinstein is the inventor of geometric unity, a proposed theory of everything, as well as being an advocate for UFO disclosure. Mick West is a science writer as well as skeptical investigator who's had some choice words to say about the disclosed footage of the phenomenon, as well as being the creator behind the software that at least purportedly substantiates his analysis. Mick West is also the author of Escaping the Rabbit Hole, How to Debunk Conspiracy Theories Using Facts, Logic, and Respect. A special thank you goes out to Mick because he was in the hot seat with the difficult task of defending the quote-unquote skeptical communities perceived tenor against those who see some non-Turin explanation behind UFOs. The links to their respective podcasts, that is, The Portal by Eric and Tales from the Rabbit Hole by Mick, can be found in the description. Another podcast that's terribly worth subscribing to is Ross Colthart's Need to Know with Zabel, and the links to that are in the description as well. My name's Kurt Jaimungle. I'm a Torontonian filmmaker with a background in mathematical physics dedicated to the explication of the variegated terrain of theories of everything, from a mainly theoretical physics perspective, but as well as analyzing consciousness and determining what constitutive role does that have to play in reality, and the fundamental laws, provided these laws exist at all and are knowable to us. A theolocution stands in contrast to a standard debate format, which I dislike because it's destructive and not furthering, generally speaking. Instead, theolocutions are attempts to understand one another and even advance the interlocutor's position, fructifying in real time rather than maligning. If you'd like to hear more podcasts from the Toe channel, then do consider going to patreon.com slash kurtjaimungle, that's C-U-R-T-J-A-I-M-U-N-G-A-L, supporting with whatever you can if you like, as the sponsors and the patrons are the only reason that I'm able to bring conversations of this quality and depth consistently as this is what I'm able to do full time now. Today's sponsor is Brilliant. During the winter break, I decided to brush up on some information theory because I would like to do a deep dive in constructor theory. So I took Brilliant's courses on random variables, distributions, and knowledge slash uncertainty. After taking that course, I could finally see why entropy is defined the way it is. It's an extremely natural formula. There are plenty of courses for example, there's also group theory. So many of you are interested in the standard model and you hear that the gauge, the internal gauge symmetries are U1 cross SU2 cross SU3. Those are examples of what are called Lie groups. Visit brilliant.org slash toe, T-O-E, to get 20% off the annual subscription. And I recommend that you don't stop before four lessons. And I think you'll be greatly surprised at the ease at which you can now comprehend subjects that you previously had an extremely difficult time grokking. Thank you and enjoy this theolocution of Eric Weinstein and Mick West. All right. So, by the way, have any of you met prior to this? Uh, no, we've just kind of interacted on Twitter a little bit, but we've never actually uh, uh, had a direct conversation before. Why don't we start with Mick, what is it that you respect about Eric? And then Eric, what is it that you respect about Mick? Well, I really respect Eric's uh, intellect and the way he uh, kind of frames issues in a whether rather sophisticated way, I think. Uh, uh, I think it's, he brings a lot to the table and that he has a, a background in science and he understands the processes of science and he understands scientists. Uh, and I also very much like his perspective that we should be doing more uh, to promote science, particularly physics. Uh, because physics, you know, essentially is the bedrock of all all the scientists, all the sciences, and it's something that's going to be fundamental to the future of the human race. And so, I, I really appreciate uh, that that kind of drive that he has to to improve science. Eric, uh, I guess what I believe is that uh, Mick is um, quite fearless in going up against the uh, very determined uh, UFO community that is clear in its beliefs. I believe that there is a certain amount of complete nonsense out there, which needs to be destroyed. And I think that that's yeoman's work. Uh, so it's kind of thankless in many ways, even if it gives you some notoriety. And I feel like Mick has been willing to blow apart things that should not have gotten the kind of mind share in the world that they did. And I think that 
Um, anybody having the courage of their convictions and being willing to stand alone and be a lightning rod for controversy and particularly directed hatred of a group um, takes a lot of uh, courage and um, inguinal fortitude. So I really appreciate that about me. Thank you. I may as well tell you both what I respect about each of you. Eric, you have unexampled views on almost every topic. And it reminds me of this comedian, Patrice O'Neill. He's one of my favorite comedians. He's no longer around. Whenever you would ask him, well, what's your opinion on, on something for which 99% of people agree upon? And you think you would predict his response. It would be original and it would make you think. And I find that quality is something that you also have, Eric. And that it's difficult to summarize what you say. Usually that happens for people who are hmm, more avant-garde in their thinking. And then for Mick, I like that you're actions follow your words so you're not just deriding you the ufo community and then leaving it you follow it with tens and tens or hundreds of hours of work put into your website and simulations and software so it's not just saying hey this clearly can't be the case and then you run away yeah no it's uh it's 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 not a job i must set that out from the beginning this isn't something that anybody pays me to do uh, this is something I'm doing of my own kind of interest, partly because I just find it fascinating, uh, but partly because I think it's also, you know, kind of an important topic. Uh, you know, I'm more into, I guess, conspiracy theories in general as being an important topic, but UFOs is a subset of that, especially the way it intersects with government. So, yeah, I'm not being paid to do this, uh, but I do think it's important. All right, Mick, do you see yourself as a skeptic or a debunker? And what's the difference between those two? Uh, that's, that's a very loaded question in a way, because uh, for a long time, I've struggled with uh, the term debunker. Uh, I wrote an article for Skeptical, Skeptical Inquirer a while back called In Defense of Debunking, uh, when I, I, I laid out the case for using the term debunker. And uh, my argument there was that if you show something to be false, then you have debunked it. And no one has a problem with the word debunked in the past tense. Uh, you know, if someone says, oh, yeah, that has been debunked, this, everyone's like, oh, OK, then that's been debunked. And you know, assuming that they can demonstrate that is true. But if you're doing it in, a, in the present tense, in the active sense, uh, people tend to think that means that you are trying to get to a certain predetermined outcome, which is very much not what I'm doing, when especially in the realm of UFOs. Now, if I was doing something like investigating flat Earth, then yes, I, I would say that I'm trying to get to a predetermined outcome because you know we've already done the work to determine that the Earth is not flat. So you know we're trying to figure out the best way of explaining why it's not flat. But with UFOs, you know, I'm more of an investigator, uh, and you know, often in the course of that investigation, I do debunk things. You know, people make a claim about a particular video, so this demonstrates amazing G-forces, and I will end up debunking that, but that's in the process of investigation. Now, skepticism, I see, the problem with skepticism is that it's not really a verb, it's not really something that you do. Do you skeptic something? You can debunk things, but you can't skeptic them. Skepticism is kind of more of, a, of an attitude. Uh, so in a way, I feel skepticism is a little bit more negative if you really get down to it. But in popular usage, debunking takes on this negative term. So I've actually, actually, after I talked to Ryan Graves, one of the pilots, uh, he told me that the fact that I had debunking in my Twitter profile was a turnoff for him. And he didn't want to talk to me initially because of that. And because of that, that was kind of the, like the, st the straw that broke the camel's back. And now I've decided to remove that from my Twitter profile and just focus on you know, being a skeptical investigator who does sometimes end up debunking things. But debunking isn't a label. I, a debunker isn't really a label that I would uh, actively use. Eric, what's the salutary role for skepticism? And do you see Mick as being a proponent of that? I'm confused by Mick. And I don't understand Mick, but consider that I really haven't been out here for very long in UFO territory. Um, it's not a region of the world, uh, the intellectual landscape that I expected to visit or spend any time in. So as of 
I don't know, two years ago, I was pretty much the guy who shut down every UFO conversation that people wanted to have around me. Um, and so that was sort of my role in my own intellectual set. And then um, I came to believe that clearly I had been the target of mis and disinformation from all sides. And then it became this question of, well, what the hell is this topic if it's not what I thought it was? And I guess I've been very surprised to have um, encountered Mick in the Twitter sphere. So I don't think of him as particularly gunning for me or out, out to get me, but there is some aspect of he's, he sees himself in a role um, with respect to a community, which, and, and let me just say the, the positive part of this there's a lot of complete nonsense in UFO land that is not only false, but is also bunk in the sense that somebody, a bunko artist needed to create the bunk in order for the bunk to exist. It's not a question of somebody saw a mylar balloon and got confused. So there's really a role for debunking. And in particular, I think there's a role for debunking aimed at our government um, because clearly the government has been up to bunk either then or now or both, but it can't be either. There has to be some aspect of this that is bunk. Um, where I get very confused is for those of us who have never particularly focused on an incident or a set of people or a group of names. I mean, I am very confused as to what Mick is trying to police <laughs> um, because at the moment, I'm just saying, like, I'm confused. And apparently, somehow, it's not good enough to be confused. One must also be clear that this is nonsense. And I'm not at all clear that this is nonsense. Well, you're confused about me. I can, maybe I can clear up what my position sure. is, what I'm actually trying to do here. And uh, partly is I'm not really trying to do anything. You know, the, I got into this, this, this field simply as a hobby. I originally started um, investigating, debunking the chemtrails conspiracy theory like over 10 years ago after I, I left the, the video game industry and I had a lot of spare time on my hands and I was like learning to fly and doing things like that. And it was just very interesting to me and it was like essentially a series of puzzles. And people say like, why do you spend so much time on this? Well, I, I kind of respond to that with uh, some people have hobbies some people spend an inordinate, inordinate amount of time on things like uh, running model trains or painting little figurines or making funny dolls or uh, you know, skydiving or whatever, whatever the hobby happens to be. And this, this topic here, like investigating things, happens to be something that really intersected with my, my skill sets uh, of debugging things, like figuring things out, what's the root cause, the root cause analysis of things. Uh, and my interest in science. I've always been interested in popular science. And so it's just something I just kind of got sucked into and it kind of spread out. And, you know, eventually I kind of settled down in a way on this UFO thing because it's so interesting in terms of the mathematics, the geometry and the physics, you know, very simple physics, you know, just simple Newtonian stuff, linear algebra and things like that. It's nothing complicated, but it's stuff that I, I used in my previous career. And so I, I kind of enjoy flexing those muscles. And recently I've been enjoying flexing my muscles, programming simulations. Uh, and yeah, I do also enjoy the interactions with people. I like talking to people. Uh, I like talking to people who believe and people who used to believe uh, and you know, to a certain degree, talking to skeptics. Although, you know, to be honest, a lot of the skeptics are, you know, rather the grumpy, boring types that, you know, don't have a lot of fun. And the UFO people are much more fun. Most fun I ever had was uh, the Flat Earth Conference I went to. That was a real party. But yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to do anything huge here. Uh, perhaps in the broader sense of uh, debunking conspiracies, I want to make the world a better place by having fewer conspiracies out there. But the vast majority of what I do is like, oh, an interesting UFO video. Let's let's have a look at it. Or you know, this guy said something. Let's see if it checks out. You know, it's it's kind of like this this fun hobby that ends up touching on things that might be fairly important. 
Well, it gives us a great deal of insight. So let me just to mix it up with you. Um, so you've, you've mentioned chemtrails and you've mm-hmm. mentioned flat earth and you've mentioned UFOs and the fun of interacting with people and debunking and making the world a better place. And, and I think I'm starting to see the outline of where this problem occurs. So the, the key issue in a lot of these things is type one versus type two error. Chemtrail sounds pretty stupid. And to be honest, little green men seems pretty dumb to me too. Uh, to say nothing of the flat earth, which seems idiotic and preposterous. Um, but if you ask me the idea of the Tuskegee medical experiment and untreated syphilis sounds dumb. Oh, really? The government's going to allow people to go untreated into tertiary syphilis or Um, we're actually going to kill Fred Hampton in his bed through COINTEL Pro using the Cook County Sheriff's Department, or we're going to trade, you know, uh, drugs for arms with Iranians and the Iran-Contra. All of these things sound dumb to me because they're clearly preposterous. And the concern that I have is that I don't believe in ghosts and I don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster and I do believe in J. Edgar Hoover's FBI as an agent agency, you know, filled with evil, targeting uh, ordinary Americans for their political beliefs uh, up to and including their personal destruction and death, including using our free press to plant stories and destroy people. And so I, I imagine you in all of these contexts. And I imagine you as the guy who said, oh, really? You think the FBI is going to come up with a story and plant it in the Los Angeles time that Gene Seberg has been a leading actress, has been impregnated and cuckolded um, her husband with a leading Black Panther? Yeah, tell me another one, Eric, except that really happened. And this is where I start to get into my issue, which is I really don't like the personal destruction of individuals who are trying to sort out fact from fiction and type one versus type two error and incredible and preposterous stories that are clearly not true and incredible and preposterous stories that are absolutely true. And the debunking energy of this is fun. It's a hobby. It's a pastime with other people on the other side of this who are not bunko artists uh, who've come to believe things. Some of those things may be completely false. Some of those things may be um, confusions. Some of those things may be true, and we're going to call them false because they're actually um, part of a storyline. For example, you could easily imagine in the UFO case that we would use a UFO cover story to uh, disguise the testing of stealth technology before anyone knew that we were working on it. And if so, if I see a giant black wedge in the sky that looks like no airplane ever, um, you know, and it was thin as a pancake, uh, I would be need, in need of debunking simply because the government had created a bunko story. I had seen something and then I had to be personally destroyed in order to make sure that the program stayed secret. So I guess I, 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 to be blunt about it, I see this as punting the responsibilities of a human being, a scientist and a skeptic to take a side in this. It's like the really Mm -hmm. difficult thing is decision boundaries, type one versus type two errors, trying to figure out who's active in trying to bunk things that needs to be debunked, who's confused, who needs to be made unconfused, and who is saying that they're seeing something that needs to be followed up and not necessarily having their reputation destroyed because somebody wants to, in your own words, flex. I don't find the flexing fun and to be, I didn't say flex. (laughs) You did say flex. Uh, I don't, well, it's not a word I actually use. So, uh, not say something about flexing your own. Oh, flexing my muscles, but it's not like flex as in like, you know, show, uh, show flexing. You did say flex. Yes, I know. But, uh, for me, flexing actually means the same thing as stretching or an exercise. But right now I just went through exactly one of these moments where I tried to remember something you'd said. And then you told me that you don't use that as a phrase. And then I happen to be able yes, to recall uh, in it. In the sense, the sense story. that you meant. I it. understand. No. Yeah. I think you did say it in the original sense from which the, the internet term flex comes from. So I don't think that's okay. even correct. So my point to you is I don't enjoy the feeling in my body right now, which is I've yeah. just contradicted <laughs> you. 
you j- assured me that that's not a term that you use. We had yeah. perhaps at, at most a misunderstanding, but the feeling misunderstand, of some, yeah. but the feeling of somebody saying, no, you're wrong. And thinking that that's fun. Your initial description of your activities as a hobby. Mm-hmm. I don't much care for this as a hobby. If it's a duty, because the world is going to be filled up with nonsense, I actually appreciate that. I want to be very clear about that. But the fun of interacting with people, many of whom are scared. I've seen people close to and uh, filled with tears. I've seen people who feel that their lives have been destroyed because they have made contact with something that they can't talk about. Me too. I I want to be very clear here. Like I'm not doing that for fun. When I talk to people, uh, and I have a podcast, uh, Tales from the Rabbit Hole, where I talk to people who are you know, believers or experiencers or whatever, and I'm very respectful. And I, I think the vast majority of people who, who are in that position, who are very upset, you know, there are people who you know, have developed serious uh, emotional issues because of their experiences. And that's something I very much respect. And I, I certainly would not, in, in any sense, say I'm having fun uh, debunking that. In fact, there's some people that I, I prefer not to even talk to because I know that they are they are so sensitive. When I'm talking about fun, I'm talking about things like geometry and programming and uh, figuring out what's in this video. And those things should be things that are essentially neutral uh, from a personal perspective. I know some people don't like it, uh, but I, I try to always keep that personal aspect of it separate. I enjoy talking to people uh, just simply from the interactions with people, but I'm always very sensitive to people's feelings. I haven't enjoyed our interaction. Uh, well, that's that's perhaps you know my my interaction style could do with some improvement. But you know when I said undoubtedly mine uh, could as well, and I look forward to improving. <laughs> I haven't blocked you. I'm just saying that the feeling I've had is yeah. I was effectively lied to that there was absolutely no there there. I believed it. What are you referring to? Uh, the idea, I thought that in, in essence, the entire UFO um, story could just be dismissed with the back of a hand that this is yeah. complete nonsense. Oh, and, I, 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 I'm kind of with you in a, in a sense on that, uh, that aspect of it. I think that the UFO story is something that uh, needs investigating. And I think what we have here is something I think that perhaps you have been doing here is kind of simplifying a very complex subject down into like, you know, it's either one thing or the other. Uh, like you would, you, you would, you were describing my, um, you know, debunking as, as, you know, some, some kind of you know, calling. I can't remember exactly what you said, but uh, I think you were kind of describing it at a very high level. You know, as if what I am doing is trying to prove that little green men don't exist and that all these people are wrong. Uh, when I look at it, I look at it at kind of the micro level uh, uh, where I am looking at individual cases and I'm trying to figure out what's actually going on in this individual case. Now, if someone asks me my opinion about the broader uh, implications of this, then I'll sure. give that. But that's not my goal. That's not what I'm actually trying to do. Uh, and when you're describing you know, what I'm doing you're describing like it's as if I have some kind of big agenda trying to, you know, debunk UFOs as a whole. I'm uh, when really, I'm just looking at individual things. Okay. I, look, I think if you look be, before two years ago, you'll, you'll find no discussion. You know, I discuss almost everything under the sun. Zero discussion of UFOs. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't think I have any particular history of, oh, do you, didn't you understand in the, in the uh, go fast video this, but on the Nimitz video, you know, such and such and Fravor said this, and, but Lazar said that, like this whole world, I'm just not even a part of. Uh, I know that there's somebody with the last name of Greer. I couldn't tell you the first name. I don't know whether they're pro or anti. It's like, I, I'm really not part of this world. Sure. Um, what I have learned is that the amount of indirect evidence that something is up and something I have to say, when I don't, when I say something, I don't mean little green men. And I mean, little green men, not as little or green or men, but just as the phrase to Mm -hmm. um, aliens. Yeah. It's like, what could be up could easily be just a disinformation campaign. It could be a cover for us, a stealth program. It's there's something up and 
I don't need to please you to tell you what weights are on the, on the branches of the decision tree. I yeah. simply need to say, boy, was I confused. This isn't just a bunch of people seeking attention uh, or some sort of promo stunt for a Spielberg film gone wrong. It, it, it's, it's quite a bit larger than that. It's a tremendous amount of indirect evidence that the basic puzzle, as I understand it, and again, I'm, I'm new here, um, is that there is zero convincing direct evidence where there's a chain of custody with the data. Um, and, you know, we, it's not only a question of a few seconds of, of video, but, you know, very detailed, multiple sensor data, everything sort of fits in, in, in some kind of a way that you could actually say, there's, no, there's essentially no way of faking this. Yeah. There's almost none of that. To, to my knowledge, there is no convincing proof in the public sphere. So that's the big thing that argues for the fact that this is not about UFOs or um, in the sense of uh, aliens and, and little green men and, and sentient intelligence. The thing that goes in the other direction though is just how much indirect evidence there is that something has been going on and how willing we've been to destroy people who've been willing to poke at this. And if you believe that the direct evidence argument is effectively a pretty good argument that nothing's here because so many of us have cameras, it's kind of amazing that nobody ever captures something that's really, really convincing. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, if you believe that story, you've got a big problem with the level of indirect evidence. If you believe the indirect evidence, you have the reverse problem. For God's sakes, why is there no absolutely crystal clear uh, data set that has slipped into the public's hands? So whatever your resolution to that puzzle is, I'm usually in the position where I come up with too many explanations. This is one of the only topics I've ever met where a creative brain can't come up with a single explanation to fit all yeah. these data points. Well, I think the, the reason for it is that there isn't a single explanation. And I think it's a mistake to try to look for one. I think there's a, a lot of things that explain both the actions of uh, government and the military and the, the various interested parties like you know, To The Stars Academy and people like that. Uh, and there's a variety of explanations for the sightings that people are having, the evidence the, that arises, and trying to kind of uh, shoehorn it into either you know one big cluster or one big cover-up. Uh, perhaps there's a degree of both in that. You know, perhaps the government does use things like UFO stories to uh, al you know, allow them to be out there at least for distractions from other things. Sure. Uh, and certainly, like we know that there's a, a variety of different interesting parties within the government. There are, there's infighting, there's, there's uh, a degree of incompetence, uh, which I, I think, you know, is kind of endemic anywhere. There's corruption, uh, there's kind of, you know, there's back dealing, there's people who uh, are doing things for their friends in government. Uh, and there's, there's a variety of things. And I, I think it's not going to be simple if we actually figure out you know, what's going on with this whole UFO thing, I think you're going to be looking at you know, hundreds and uh, maybe thousands of different data points that, and there won't be like one big smoking gun either way. Wait, wait a second. Let's just take one category of UFO thing. So we have mylar balloons and swamp gas and disinformation campaigns and experimental aircrafts and drones and and. Uh, non-friendly nations, blah, blah, blah. Let's just take everything that is a normal sounding explanation that can account for this. And, and let's take various claimed UFO encounters and attribute those to those explanations that we're all prepared to accept include some of the sightings or experiences. Is there anything left over in your opinion that's really unsettled because it's a question of overlapping explanations for like, it could be the Chinese or it could be the Russians or it could be the Iranians or it could be swamp gas. It's like, I get that those are all the same style of explanations, 
I mean, if if the the government says they have 143 unsolved or 142 now, they just said they well, the chief scientists just said they solved one yesterday. Uh, but they those are actually cases that are unsolved that they were unable to determine what they actually are, and the likely explanation is simply that there isn't enough data. So there's definitely going to be lots of interesting things out there. Uh, they probably fit into one of the the categories of things like airborne clutter or atmospheric effects or heavenly bodies or planes or misidentifications, things like that. But we can't determine what they actually are. Uh, but what we don't have is what you said earlier. We don't have something that's unambiguously uh, unusual, something that demonstrates advanced aerodynamic uh, capabilities or yes, something that then... seems to defy the known laws of physics. But uh, we certainly have lots of unresolved things. Now, I don't think that necessarily right? means anything. I think that's that's just something that's inevitable. And I think that when we have you know, more detailed inspections of data sets, it's just going to, revo it's going to resolve more things, not resolve, it's going to bring up things like that. RV Loeb's new program, the Project Galileo program, he's, he's trying to set up these telescopes and these sensors which will detect when something's there and then they'll zoom in on it and then they'll take photographs of it and he says maybe they'll see the you know, made, in, uh, um, made in outer space sticker on it. But probably what's going to happen is just you're going to get more blurry photos uh, and they will be un undetermined. So it's inevitable. But let's get back to your superposition argument we all agree that it's going to be a superposition that's not the interesting you know if it could be iran or it could be china that's a superposition of different explanations no one says that all drones have to come from one country the key issue isn't superpositions of different mundane categories the key issue is is there anything at the moment that argues in your mind for an exotic explanation, time traveling humans, visitors from another galaxy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not in my mind, no. And right. uh, I, I'm curious as to why people, individual people, I mean, that's part of my interest actually, is, is trying to figure out why people believe uh, what, they, what they believe. Why do people believe weird things? Why do people think that time traveling uh, humans from the future is actually a reasonable explanation. Why do they think that uh, trickster spirits is is a reasonable explanation? I know there's, there's some fairly serious people who use the term trickster uh, as uh, uh, kind of an explanation for UFOs. There's some kind of trickster from another dimension who has who's come over. You know, Jacques Vallée, I think, is a big proponent of this, and uh, uh, his his uh, his colleague. Um, I forget his name now, but uh, uh, they, they talk about tricksters. What is it that actually makes people who are at one point serious scientists go over to thinking that uh, essentially poltergeists from outer space is a reasonable explanation for things? Now, I don't say that to, to I mean, that sounds like I'm mocking them, but that's it actually like the type them. of things they did. It does sound like I'm mocking them. Yes, I know, but uh, that's an unfortunate. So look, I don't want to trap you in Mick. I don't want to trap you in language. If it sounds that way to your ears, well, it's just real quick. It's real quick. I want to. I want to address that point. Like, I'm not mocking them. I'm essentially trying to accurately describe their positions, and it's unfortunate that uh, with a lot of these things, you know, if you talk about, say, flat Earth, if you try to describe the position, it comes across as ridiculous. Uh, when someone is, is using tricksters from another dimension as an explanation for UFOs, it comes across as ridiculous, but it's actually what they say. But no, you, let, let's try this carefully. Let me imagine that you and I are living on North Sentinel Island uh, in the Andaman chain in, in the Indian Ocean. And I say, you know, I can't help but feel that there's a bigger world out there and that every time something tries to contact us, there's a force, an unseen force that stops them from making contact. And we've become really belligerent. We keep throwing spears and, and shooting arrows at anything that approaches our beaches. But I have this feeling that a, a power exists that is screening all contact and that there's an entire world of people like us and dissimilar from us who want to contact us. And you say, Oh, really? You, you think there's like a, a federation that is, really cares about us and stops us from being contacted and they're tricksters in the sense that 
They, uh, they prevent landings uh, so that we will think that we are isolated and alone in the world. And, you know, I'm trying to describe India. And you're making fun of the fact that I'm trying to describe India. I don't have the word India because I've never spoken a word of Hindi or I don't know that I'm probably an Indian citizen according to the world. But North Sentinel Island has one of these problems, which is it's got effectively a, an unseen force called India that acts in some sense as a trickster to make sure that they're not in good Copernican position to be able to observe the world. And here I've got Mick West talking about this in terms of what well, sounds ridiculous because it is ridiculous. Yeah. And the answer is no, it's not ridiculous at all. No, it's not. But if I was on North Sentinel Island, I would be pointing out all the evidence that we have for this thing. You know, we see contrails from jets flying overhead. We see boats. Uh, occasionally, people come and they land on the island and there's, there's trouble. So we've got a lot of evidence that uh, these, these things actually exist. You know, if, they, if, if they were in a completely isolated ocean, uh, island in the middle of the ocean and they were hypothesizing about something with no evidence, and that would be a different thing. See, it's all I about think, the evidence. They ha they have evidence on North Sentinel Island for that hypothesis that you propose. And I believe that we have evidence both for and against active visitation by intelligent life that we do not perceive as any of our own civilization. But not very good evidence. They have very I, good evidence on North Sentinel Island because they can actually see people. They can actually see things like planes. They can see boats. You know, very often in, in science experiments, I've watched people throw out the outliers because they have a feeling that you're allowed to throw out the outliers. And sometimes the outliers are bad pieces of information. Uh, this occurs in, you know, the tau theta puzzle story that Richard Feynman tells about the asymmetry of the weak force. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it, it's real information. Sometimes it's an artifact of, of the environmental setup. Well, what, I t what outliers do you think are being thrown out of the UFO sphere? What outliers do you think are being thrown out of the UFO sphere? We don't have like amazing videos that are just being thrown out because they're... Well, I, th I think you and I are disagreeing about something more fundamental. My feeling is, is that th there's a sort of debunking energy versus a scientific energy. And I kind of like debunking, to be honest, when it, it's your great aunt's poltergeist in her second home. You know, and there's a story about a kid who committed suicide in 1913 and, and now haunts the house. And I don't want to have to deal with that stuff scientifically. I don't want to have to write an NSF grant and, and, and get the University of Puget Sound involved or whatever. It, there's a role for debunking. And then there's the problem mm -hmm. of the debunkers. And I, I think we have to actually talk about debunking as sure, kind yeah. of a, an antisocial negative movement. I want to... <laughs> Sorry, let, let me. Know. I think that's ridiculous, though. I think that's frankly, I think it's ridiculous because you know, I, oh. I, I identify as a debunker. Uh, you know, I, I've said there are problems with that term. So unless you're talking about somebody else, I assume you're talking about me. No, no, uh, no. I'm talking about there is a movement of people, right? All right. So, do you see me as being part of that movement? Well, you've been curious in my mind. You're certainly, and again, I'm, I'm not angling for anything in particular. I'm not a takedown artist. I don't love interpersonal conflict. It feels to me like in the world of debunkers, and I've now met them in multiple fields, you are one of the most disciplined, and to be honest, one of the most charitable that I've met. Now, so this isn't principally about Mick West. The problem that I have with this as a movement, first of all, Skepticism doesn't pay very well. I've talked to Michael <laughs> Shermer about this. Um, it's very hard to, to do the yeoman's work of skepticism it and is. make it entertaining. So the problem with most of the skeptic movement is that you start off trying to say, look, I'm just trying to keep the crap out of science so that we can have a conversation that's not always cluttered with somebody's ghost stories or, or whatnot. Okay, and So that's very important, particularly with respect to religion. Religion always wants to intrude. Then you get into this problem, which is you have to spice up your skepticism because it's not really tremendously entertaining. So that's when you typically get snark, you get condescension, you get stigma. And all of those things tend to chase good people out of these discussions 
much the way good people are chased out of politics. There's an idea that politics belongs to people who don't mind having five private investigators scurrying about over their life to interview every ex boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, you know, to dig up any dirt to be printed on the front page of the New York Times. My feeling about this is a lot of us who would like to run for office, like to see other people run for office, are very angry that the political crowd is taking this over. And it's like, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, the same thing is true with UFOs. My feeling is I want to hear from a lot more people. And one of the things that I want, no, I want to hear from a lot more people. And one of the things that I want them to know is that there are smart, caring people who, as long as they're not telling some BS story, and as long as they're willing to reconsider their views, don't need to be debunked. Because that yeah. stigma is antithetical. I, I to, agree. Antithetical I agree. to science. Well, be, just be careful what you agreed to, because I, I don't want to. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's all sounds good so far. Okay. Uh, Nick, why don't you the implications? Why don't you recapitulate what Eric said so that we can see if there is indeed agreement? Well, um, yeah, I think Eric is saying essentially that um, there's a certain type of uh, criticism of various fields, and we're talking about UFO in particular here, uh, the type of criticism that is identified as the debunking community that has a stifling uh, effect, like a negative effect, um, the, uh, uh, the chilling effect, uh, which prevents discussion because people feel like they're being attacked, they feel like they're being ridiculed, people don't like that. Uh, a lot of people involved uh, have a deeply emotional connection to it, and so they're not going to come forward if they feel that they are going to be ridiculed. And and I agree that that is a problem. And I, I think you know, in, in the broader sense, it's been a problem at the government level, uh, in that the historically the government has basically completely ignored the the UFO problem, the the UFO issue. If you look at what the FAA was doing, say even just ten years ago. Uh, they basically said, call this paranormal hotline. It was a UFO hotline, but it, it still went to a, a site which uh, also dealt with, with ghosts and things like that. So there has been this kind of ridicule uh, of, of the issue. And I really don't think that you know, I, or indeed most skeptics uh, who actually look into UFOs uh, are really part of that type of ridicule. We actually investigate cases in great depth we, we do the math, we do the work, we sometimes go out and do the field work, we do recreation experiments, we try to figure things out. I've interviewed lots of eyewitnesses and I do it with the greatest respect and I trust that what they are telling me is what they believe to be true. Uh, so I, I would really welcome uh, people to come forward with, with evidence. Why would you trust them? I would imagine that some of those people are not to be trusted in their attention. Trust is my simply my default position. Oh, uh, that's I, fine. I usually assume from the start that people are going to tell the truth because that's been my experience that most people do. Now that has burnt me in in, in the past a little bit. Uh, like people will will uh, you know do overtures to you and then they'll turn around. Uh, but most of the time, you, know, you catch more flies with honey. I'm not trying to catch flies; it's probably a poor analogy. But it's uh, I I. I'm naturally a nice guy. I, when I talk to people, you know, I, I empathize with them, and I, I understand that you know it's it's a difficult thing to talk about. Uh, so, well, let me ask you a question. Sure. I don't have the sense that there's any real reason for any animosity between you and myself, to be honest, at all. No. <laughs> Why do yeah. I have the takeaway of what are you doing in my timeline again? In other words. <laughs> I would imagine that in a slightly different world, universe A prime rather than A where we live, uh -huh. you and I would be naturally allied on this topic. And sure. yeah, we're so, scientists, scientific type people who have a natural skepticism of things. Okay. So I didn't come looking for you. And then multiple times you've sort of entered in and you're, you know, mm. you're talking in specific about Lou Elizondo and somebody who I, I think I've never mentioned the name Chris Mellon. I hope I'm that it's yeah Chris Mellon. I can't remember everybody's name. He's a uh, government official who's uh, part of the whole Invisible College type thing. Okay, so why? What is it that you perceive me as doing that needs to be 
sort of minded? Well, you uh, make bold declarative statements about this, you know, that this is a huge deal. I believe this is the thing where I yeah. started to interact with you, that you thought it was like a, a huge deal that either there are some kind of, you know, advanced technology flying around that we don't know what it is, or there's some kind of uh, big, you know, cluster starting with Harry Reid. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what you said, but I think you, you were something along those lines. Yeah. And I think at the time I was basically saying what I am saying now, that it is you know, more complicated than that. And the reason I, I interacted with you, and I probably wouldn't with just some, some random person, right. is that you have reach. You know, you've got a lot of followers. You've got a very popular podcast. You, you know, you've, written, you've written books. You know, you're quite well known. And people take what you said and you become a hero within the UFO community and they listen to what you said. So I, I feel it needs addressing. Eric's written a book. I haven't gotten a copy. It's a secret invisible book. Um, but sorry, okay. Mick, I didn't mean to so, interrupt. So Mick, I, I stand by my statement. This is a huge, big deal. And I don't mean this UFOs. I mean, uh -huh. this decision tree has no boring branch. Yeah, I, I'm actually kind of in a little way coming around a little bit more to that than I was at the time when I first uh, disagreed with you. First of all, I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's not not in a victory lap kind of a way, just in terms of evolution. Yeah, I have no problem changing my opinion when new data arrives. Yeah, it, well, the, let me explain why uh, I've kind of come around a little bit. I think it's it's really being the increasing uh, looks behind the curtain that we've been having, I guess, over the last year and actually culminating just a couple of days ago. And you probably didn't have a chance to look at it. I sent the email yesterday about Travis Taylor, the chief scientist of the UAP task force. And uh, he's someone who was hired by the, the lead of the UAP task force to be the chief scientist. And he contributed to this UAP report that we're, we're all familiar with. Uh, but he's also the chief scientist on a TV show, The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. And he's also been a visiting scientist on other things like uh, ancient aliens. And he had a TV show called uh, uh, Redneck Rockets, I think, or Backyard Rockets Scientists. He's, he's really very unexpected as the choice of someone who uh, wants to be neutrally investigating uh, UFOs. Because on the one hand, he's at Skinwalker Ranch on TV basically promoting the idea that there's some kind of weird interdimensional tricksters coming through and doing weird things at Skinwalker Ranch. Whilst at the same time, he's supposed to be soberly investigating the evidence and writing UAP reports and briefing Congress. It really doesn't make any sense. And I was, I was frankly, I was flabbergasted uh, when the news, news broke a couple of days ago that he was in Is fact it? the chief scientist. Do you know this person? Uh, I've I've talked to him a little bit online, but I, I don't I don't know him personally. No. So I have spoken to Eric Baird, who is out there on that Skinwalker mm -hmm. Ranch History Channel project, and I've spoken to Brandon, who I know a little bit, who owns the ranch. Yeah, I've spoken to Brandon too. Pardon uh, me. I interviewed him for my podcast. I interviewed Pardon Brandon me? for my podcast. So I'm we're, we're kind of friendly on on Twitter too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have to tell you that part of their problem is that they believe, and I, I don't think they're lying to me. I could be wrong. No. So let me just, no, I'm going to be careful about this. I believe that they think they've seen enough weird stuff that it's effectively almost impossible to keep this air of detachment going. Yeah. And if you, if you look carefully on Travis's, uh, you know, statements, he basically has gotten to the point where he's like, we've seen so much weird stuff here. You know, I, I never would have believed this two summers ago, but this and that. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. still careful to say we don't know what's going on, but he's certainly decamped into a position where he's saying, I've now seen so much weird, unexplainable, inexplainable stuff that I cannot affect the same position of studied neutrality that would occur before I tutored my Bayesian prior. And this is not necessarily a knock against him. In other words, if the, I, 
I have been told by multiple people who do not strike me as charlatans. I only wish you'd seen what we have because yeah. we're wasting time in this conversation. Now, I have noted on social media that I am tired of being told that I'm going to be shown something. And then, like Lucy in the football, I never managed to make contact with the football. And as a science, as a, as a PhD in STEM, I feel duty bound to report that I have been spun up several times only to be wound down and told that it's got to be deferred because of some meeting or some change in plans. So, I have no idea whether this outreach is a form of disinformation in which well-meaning individuals are constantly put in some sort of tantalus-like situation. Um, Was one of those invitations to go to Skinwalker? Oh, I've I've had multiple invitations to go to Skinwalker from Brandon. And have you taken him up on that? No, I haven't. And for reasons that you may find amusing. Um, one of the things that I did was consult with some people about the safety issues of, um, this UFO stuff. And they said, um, things that I wasn't really prepared for. One of which a particular individual said to me, there is absolute tissue damage that we can record, um, that comes out of stories of encounters and you make what you want of the encounter story, but it is completely consistent with uh, our biopsies and uh, our understanding of, of what cell death has occurred, um, which I found really interesting. I mean, here I'm talking to published scientists. It sounds like evidence. It sounds like evidence. But my point would be whether or not I understand that as aliens or whether or not I understand that as that there's a uranium deposit or who knows what, I, mm-hmm. I, I don't know enough about secret weapons or geology or, or who knows what, yeah. you know, I, I do know that I've been warned um, that bad things happen to people who get too close to some of this stuff. Well, it doesn't stop them filming a TV show there. Uh, yeah, I, I, Brandon actually invited me. It may not stop me from going out either. Yeah. No, Brandon has invited me. Maybe we, maybe we should go together and then we can uh, uh, compare notes. Uh, Brandon has invited me and I have not, uh, I recently uh, reached out to him to try to take up on him, but he's been like busy and hasn't really got back to me yet. But you know, I would still like to go to Skinwalker and if, you, if you're interested. I'm potentially willing to consider it Off air, I asked Mick if he would be willing to engage in so-called CE5, that is close encounters of the fifth kind, if someone offered to perform it with him, and time was sufficiently limited, travel paid for, it was done by someone known for their consistency in this regard, etc. As this is a technique which purportedly reliably induces quote-unquote contact. Mick responded, I would go. I think there are probably no supernatural phenomenon or visiting aliens, but if I'm going to criticize something, then it's only fair that I try to fully understand what people are experiencing by observing them experiencing it, and maybe even get a sense of it for myself. There's some topics I would love to actually hear your take on as an expert, because I'm not one. One thing I found very distressing about this whole topic is I was willing to reconsider my UFO position separately from attendant positions, which I don't really want to get into. So the first thing that's very hard to separate off is this cattle mutilation claim, Mm, right? So in other words, you think you just want to talk about, um, uh, actually I'll go in later to the issue about why I'm interested in UFOs for, for scientific reasons, but assume that, assume that you just want to talk about UFOs, you get into cattle mutilation, and then you get into progressively weirder and weirder sounding stuff that I'm not excited about. The the least exciting thing for me is this remote viewing stuff, (laughs) right? It's interesting from a historical perspective. Say more. From the, uh, the actions of the government. The government did research into remote viewing and in reaction to the Russians doing research into remote viewing. 
uh, I believe back in the, the 50s or 60s, Project Stargate. And this was a real thing. Uh, so I think, you know, even though it's something that sounds kind of somewhat ridiculous, it's something that's actually bubbled its way to the top in a way that, you know, UFOs are bubbling their way up now. It's, uh, uh, it's something that, you know, Men Who Stare at Goats, the film is based on, on real, real events. So, you know, these, these things, you know, they, they, they don't sound interesting and they're a bit silly, but they had consequences. If the door is open for UFOs being a real phenomenon, whatever, let's place brackets and just say it's an extraordinary phenomenon, then why does that not open the door to other extraordinary phenomenon, which is also attested to by high ranking individuals and there are government studies such as remote viewing? Why is it provoking an unfavorable reaction from you? I I don't know whether you saw my interaction with Hal put off on the topic of predicting the markets. Yeah. So why don't you? <laughs> well, no, it was a bit more subtle than that. Um, his claim was is that he was able to predict the markets yes. in order to effectively replace a bake sale or something at a local school. And by getting 10%, he could make somebody else, I forget, $260,000 and he could get $26,000, which is all he needed. And then he stopped predicting the markets. Yeah. The yeah. typical energy around that would go like, dude, if you could become rich, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's not my energy. My energy it's is the different. Evidence. My energy is if you could do this reliably, you could settle so many debates by proving like you assume you don't care about money and assume whatever this that and the other thing you do care about credibility and you could increase your credibility by inviting people onto your private jet to take you to your private islands etc cetera, etc cetera, by just doing this relentlessly and then yeah. that conversation didn't go anywhere now if you notice in jesse's cut of that interaction I stayed on that point doggedly um, and, and he cut a lot of it out, but you see him say this thing where he says like, I, I think we've, I think we've addressed this issue. Um, but I was always trying to be polite. I was not trying to take Hal to mm -hmm. task in a way that let him look ridiculous. I was, you know, I, I find this claim disturbing like you, I don't want to let these claims in if they cloud our judgment. It's very important to me that we not have nonsense claims. I don't want to say he's a liar. I don't want to say I believe this to be true. I don't know what to make of it. I'm yeah. probably backing off of it before I do more damage. I don't like these other claims, Kurt, because the cattle mutilations are the ones that are closest to sounding like UFOs. And the remote viewing sounds like a different force carrier. In other words, if, if you imagine that you and Kurt, where are you currently? Toronto? Toronto. Yeah. And Mick, you are in Sacramento. Sacramento. So somehow we're all having this conversation on a screen in real time almost. And this is only possible because of photons and electrons. Imagine that there are new force carriers like photons that can be used to transmit information that can go through, I don't know, seawater, who knows what. It's possible that you could get a new physics to explain remote viewing and that microtubules are, you know, uh, sure. antenna in the brain and blah, blah, blah. It's not completely outside of the realm of possibility, but it's also pretty far fetched, right? And it's important to be able to say this sounds like total nonsense without necessarily needing to destroy somebody in the process. Yeah. And it sounds well, like nonsense. I, to me. I think your, you know, your polite, uh, sorry, uh, your, your polite questioning uh, of Hal Putoff was, was the right thing. You were pressuring him there. And it's not really about why don't you use this to make loads of money because you, know, you could very easily and give a reason why you don't need the money. It's it's why don't you demonstrate this this amazing new physics or this amazing new phenomena to science? If remote viewing was actually a demonstrable thing, it would be one of the most incredible revolutions in science in um, you know ever really. 
it would be as you des describe perhaps a new force of physics uh, an entirely new understanding of consciousness and the brain uh, it would be a big deal and yet hal putoff is just like um oh, yeah, i kind of got bored of doing that and didn't took too much time i wanted to do other things it was it seemed ridiculous i couldn't understand the answers that came back yeah yeah mick do you see remote viewing as equally far-fetched as taking ufos seriously as some extra ordinary phenomenon i i see it as equally unbased in evidence you know if it's if it's something that could be done it would be huge and you know to that extent you can understand why people in the military perhaps people with a little bit of magical thinking uh went for it if you hear that the russians are doing something and they're having success doing something you know, the, you know obviously the uh, intelligence wasn't quite as uh, as good as you might might like you're getting these these things out of russia then yeah, why not stick a team on trying to figure out whether it's real or not? But neither the Russians found anything nor the uh, nor the Americans. Let me come up with a, pl a more plausible explanation. We know that, for example, Leon Theremin, who discovered uh, capacitance as a musical instrument, which bears his name, uh, was in the Sharyashka prison system, um, which is these country club prisons for like STEM geniuses to work on Soviet projects while, while, while in prison. And he came up with, if, if I'm not mistaken, a, a means of watching the vibrations of a window pane and using it as a mm. microphone so that you could tell what was going on in the U.S. Embassy, for example. And, you know, I believe there was also a plaque that was a listening device. Imagine that you had lots of ways yeah. in to listening to the Americans inside of the Russian Embassy more broadly. I would easily think about developing remote viewing as an explanation for how how could they have known that, yeah. right? Yeah, it could it'd have be a, a fine cover story because you would actually be able to tell what conversation somebody was having in private. Yeah, um, as it's, a result, it's like they, they, they're using magic to explain away their own incompetence in a way. That that plaque that you referred to was was on the wall for I think you know, several years before they discovered it had a, a microphone in it. And so they, they know that secrets were getting out. And rather than actually go down the actual real route of like sweeping their embassy for bugs, they started perhaps, you know, this, this kind of magical thinking that remote viewing was real and we should investigate it. So in such a case, I would understand why there would be a story. And this is one of the reasons that uh, I think a lot of these stories got formed in a time before the internet. And so the problem with a story like this is, is that you, you can, it, it was easier to keep brittle structures of narrative together before there were so many people chiming in and you could crowdsource data or understandings of yeah. what was going on. And that's, that's what's happening, I think, to a degree now with whenever the secret evidence comes out, it gets examined by a very large number of people and, and quite often gets resolved. And when that happens, it essentially reveals the incompetence of the people who have been looking into it. Like there's this green triangle uh, video that's been knocking around for quite some time. Oh, this is your lens aperture point or? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's basically been 100% you know, conclusively shown that this is just an artifact of the camera and that the vast majority of the, the green triangles in this video we just start. And yet we have uh, statements and leaks uh, that uh, say that they thought that these stars in the sky that appear triangular were actually some kind of flying craft and, and even some kind of flying triangular craft. But when it gets released, and especially the high quality video, when that gets released, it's pretty much apparent what it is to people who, who are familiar with these things. So you know, someone made the argument that perhaps you know, they're not releasing this data partly because they don't want to be shown up. They're afraid of the things being solved and them looking stupid, which is kind of what happened with this Green Triangle thing. You know, the, the lead scientist of the UAP task force, Travis Taylor, he didn't think that they were, they were uh, uh, stars. And then I kind of explained it to him in a bit more detail and now he's changed his mind and now he thinks that they are. But you know, for years, the UAP task force was laboring under this misapprehension that these these flying uh, these flying things were green triangles when they were in fact 
identifiable stars that we can name and show on a star map. So, so there's, there's a real issue there of cover your ass, which might be uh, <laughs> cooling things down a little. Well, one of, the, one of my questions is why do we not have our best people on this? And this was my point, I think, yeah. where you and I came in contact in some sense in Twitter, where I was saying, if somebody is claiming that we cannot control airspace that is sensitive from a military perspective. Um, is that what they're claiming, though? I mean, they're not claiming we can't control it. They're claiming that we occasionally see things in there that we can't identify. And we, we haven't determined that they are you know, under control by an intelligent entity. Uh, so it's more of an issue of we have clutter in our airspace and we don't know what it is. You and I have heard different things. I have heard that we cannot control our airspace, that these things are not that uncommon, that these are actually um, much more frequently found near sensitive military installations and exercises. Mm. And that they can potentially turn off and on nuclear devices? Well, that's, <laughs> these, are, these are claims beyond... There, the, how do I even put this? One of the things that you don't know about in this world until you actually start talking to people is which of these stories are highly conserved through people who don't seem to even know each other, right? So for example, let me just take two sets of triangular pyramid-like issues. There is apparently a configuration of a craft, like people who chart these things say that a lot of these UFOs look very dissimilar, but that there are clusters of things that seem to be highly conserved over mm -hmm. decades. One of these conserved <laughs> things is supposed to be a flat equilateral triangle with three lights in it, uh, slightly recessed from its vertices with round rounded yeah. points. Okay. Then you have this thing with the fact that the way that these lenses open and close is with, you know, some sort of, uh, and Mick, you, you'll have the right terminology for these sort of interlinked um, yeah, sliding just the, the, the leaves of uh, the iris. The leaves. I didn't have the word leaves. Yeah. So that somehow the, the leaves create triangles. And then you have this confluence between people who claim to have seen a very conserved triangular craft and something that shows up as a triangular blotch of light. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are willing to swing at any pitch because they're willing to say, oh, well, that's that thing that was spotted over Belgium or was it Montevideo or who knows what. Um, I, I have heard many of these stories now from pretty sober people. Yeah. And I would never, never have heard any of these stories until I was willing to make myself stupidly vulnerable to this topic saying, geez, I thought this was all BS. Um, having now opened myself to that, I cannot explain how many highly conserved stories I've heard from various people that don't show any interest in being public, don't yeah. seem to be happy about the fact that they have pieces of information that distress them. It, it's pretty weird for, yeah. But I, I think, you know, this is something that has historically been the case. And I think it perhaps might tell us something more about people than about what's going on uh, up in the sky. Uh, yeah. There was a famous ufologist, J. Allen Hynek, who used to be a debunker you know, for the government. And you know, his job was really to investigate things and figure out what they were and explain them to the public. But over time, uh, he became convinced that there was something to it. And he largely became convinced from the eyewitness accounts of, of a number of people. Uh, but you know, on the way there, he did a, lo a lot of research into how easy it is for people to make mistakes. And he interviewed a lot of people who were very convinced that they saw something but he also managed to resolve what it was that they actually saw. And this is something that we see time and time again, that uh, people are deeply convinced that they, their, their memory or their perception of an event is very accurate. And they did in fact see some kind of uh, equilateral triangle block out the, the stars, but sometimes it's, uh, it can be resolved if you actually have enough information into something like a blimp or, or a plane or a flock of birds. Have you ever heard Brandon's I mean, story? Uh, Brandon, Brandon Fugel. Yeah. 
Uh, I, which one? I, he's got a couple. There's the, the lost time one. and Yeah, where there's suddenly the people seem to be paralyzed and right yeah. over the, the mesa, not very many feet from his head is a giant floating metallic structure. I mean, yeah, that, it's he, fascinating. I mean, <laughs> where does that where does that come from? It's uh, is is there something there, or is is it you know did he did he imagine it? Is it a dream? Is it a hallucination? Is there some kind of weird gas in the air that's making him do these things? These these are valid questions, I think. He told that story at a dinner I was at. To uh -huh. maybe there were 12, 15 people at the dinner. At the end of the dinner, we walk out. And I'm standing around with maybe 10 of those people. Brandon is not in evidence. And we talked about many things. And I said, well, what did you guys think of the dinner? And nobody brought up the fact <laughs> that a businessman who seems to be ostensibly normal, oriented towards family and, and real estate and all these things, just described an unfakeable encounter i mean you know it, yeah. it could have been that a small amount of very weird dmt got into his uh, kombucha but on the other hand um probably not i just don't know what that story corresponds to it's too vivid too clear yeah. it's too unlike other things I think that the reaction you described there is interesting to me from the, the other people but perhaps also from brandon himself and uh, i always kind of I'm reminded by a thing in medicine called uh, la belle indifference, uh, which the the beautiful indifference, which is a, a medical term for people who have um, essentially somatic injuries, like they believe that their their hand is paralyzed or that they're blind in one eye, but that they're not, but they're kind of indifferent to it, and it it's it's that kind of inexplicable indifference to something that you would think they would would be a big deal. That you see quite often in in UFOs, and the people who see them, they they you know they're getting on with their lives. They say, oh yeah, I saw a UFO once. And if I saw a UFO, that'd be the biggest thing ever, the most amazing thing in my life. No, maybe, and even if someone told me that I I trusted about you know told me a story, that would be whoa, that is amazing. And oh, why is this guy talking about this? You would think there would be some kind of reaction, but it's almost like there's a little I don't know attention blindness or something. Have like you ever had a near death experience, like a really I have not. No. Yeah. It wears off really quickly. Like right mm. after you have it, you think, oh my God, I'm so happy to be alive. I'm, you make all these plans of what you're going to do. And in two weeks, you're just back to normal. Yes. Yes. I've, I've had things like that with an illness where during the illness, it's the, the worst thing ever and your world is collapsing. And then you get better and it's like, ah, whatever. Whatever. So I understand that people can screen this out, but what I'm trying to say is that by making this stuff outre, stuff that cannot be discussed, pushing it outside the Overton window, we're screwing up the science. And mm -hmm. I don't do many of these. Look, I, I really hate interpersonal drama. And so in general, I avoid these like imagined dust ups because I was never looking for a dust up with you, which we share too much in common. I'm worried that you're screwing up the Overton window when mm. we need to be dragging it more open so we get more information. And the idea that this can be debunked before it's really understood speaks to me of how I would handle faith healing where somebody's trying to separate older people from their money by claiming that a laying on of hands can replace yeah, their health care. I, I think it I think again, you're, you're oversimplifying it and saying I'm trying to debunk the whole subject. I'm sure if, yeah. I were, if it was faith healing, that would be you know, a valid argument that I would be trying to debunk faith healing because I think faith healing. So would I. Yeah. Perhaps other than a, the placebo effect is, is nonsense. But UFOs, I think, represent a variety of different things. And I think there's a possibility that some of them are, you know, perhaps interesting technology from other countries, and a very small possibility that it's uh, aliens, and an even smaller one that Let's it's talk about from that small dimension. possibility because the door is open. So let me get my foot wedged in it like a good uh, encyclopedia sure. salesman from days of old. What if? What if aliens were real? Uh, it Doesn't depends. have to be aliens. Could be. Yeah. Could be us. 
Yeah, no, it, if if there was something there in terms of advanced technology, that would be very, very Why interesting. Why do you say technology? Uh, because, you know, if it's not technology, it's going to be magic. And I think technology is kind of the thing no. to come to first. I, I want, I, oh, I, you're I, talking about the, uh, you know, perhaps like some kind of weird government cover-up type thing? No, 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 no. Let's slow it down. Okay. I'm mostly interested in this ultimately because of science. Mm -hmm. Not technology. I don't think that I know anything about there. There's no reason that this has to involve new science. But if I saw somebody explode an atomic weapon before the neutron was discovered, I'd mm -hmm. search for the neutron. Sure. So right. the neutron I, was discovered in 1932 which I keep thinking about, my aunt is older than the discovery of the neutron. What's interesting here is assume for the moment that that slim possibility that you and I both acknowledge exists, that we could be looking at alien technology, but it would be built on science we don't have, yes. not technology, because people keep freezing Einstein in, which has become very distressing to me. You cannot go faster than the speed of light within Einstein's construct. But Einstein's construct is the map, not the territory. And we don't know whether a better map allows us to do things that are prohibited on this map, but not necessarily with a better understanding of reality. So if this were technology based on new science held by some civilization that we don't know anything about, could be us from the future, could be somebody from neighboring galaxies, who knows what. It's hugely consequential scientifically. Yeah. And one of the things that causes me to, despite wanting to get on with you and understand each other better, you know, also sort of push back relatively forcefully, is I don't want that window stigmatized anymore. It's like, it's enough. Sure. Uh, well, I think with the technology versus science question, I'm kind of in the why not both camp. Uh, new science is great and new technology would indicate new science, but new technology is also an implementation of that understanding of those scientific principles, which in itself would be useful and interesting. It should be clear about why I'm saying it this way. There's a general tilt away from science towards technology. And there are two hijacked conversations. One is that mm. every time we end up talking about this, it goes to the technology discussion um, because markets have been hot and science in particular physics has been kind of stagnant for a long time. And that means that people inadvertently start thinking about new technology from old science if we don't actually keep talking about science. The other thing is that Elon has more or less taken a an imperative, which is that humans figure out whether we can stop sharing one planet and one atmosphere in order to diversify our risk and turned it into a conversation about SpaceX and Mars. And in both cases, what we're doing is we're, we're taking away from a very real conversation, which is we've got a potential you know, situation with a dictator who's invaded a neighboring country as if the 20th, 20th century never happened in Europe of all places, right next to Article 5 territory. This is extremely dangerous. And if human beings don't take the message from COVID and from Putin in Ukraine, that we better try to figure out whether we can spread out because anything like an airborne uh, respiratory virus or, or you know radiation can cover the planet very quickly, um, we're in trouble. So it's very important to me to prop the window open to, is it possible to leave this place? And the, the chief reason that we are unlikely to be able to leave this place, and thus we are likely to die in relatively short order due to our technological prowess and our lack of wisdom, is the Einsteinian limit on travel. Now, It's very hard to prop that window open because people have frozen Einstein in and Elon in. And those two individuals have changed this conversation. The Einsteinian contribution means we always talk about is faster than light possible, which we shouldn't be talking about. We talk about 
wormholes. We talk about Alcubierre drives. We talk about time dilation and multigen. We talk about uploading into silicon. All of these things are useless, right? <laughs> On the other front, Elon has focused us in, in the diversity conversation um, to diversify from all on Earth to all on Earth plus Mars, as if we're going to terraform Mars before Elon turns 60. And both of these are very dangerous conversations when we have a very narrow hope of asking, should we be looking to figure out whether there's something beyond Einstein, which gives us possibilities beyond Einstein? So this is one of the reasons I'm most interested in the Overton window here, which is if Einstein's restrictions persist in the, to the ultimate theory, we're in a lot of trouble. It means we're probably not going anywhere and we, our only hope is to stabilize this planet, which I don't see much hope in doing given how powerful we've become. Um, and we have to get away from technology and from rockets and from Elon and from Einstein, if we're going to actually turn this into a legitimate question, which is, is there anywhere we can actually go? Or as is likely the case, we're stuck here. And well, I think really again, I'm a, a why not in the why not both camp there? It's, uh, you know, obviously we need to develop our technology. And yes, it would be great if we had more adventurous uh, explorations of physics. Uh, but I don't really see how what I'm doing in any way uh, narrows the Overton or expands the Overton oh, window. I'm not sure which way I want people. I want people who think they have UFO data to be mm -hmm. welcomed scientifically and not stigmatized and made to feel as if uh, they're aberrant works for me. freaks. Works what? for me. If people okay. have UFO data, yeah, I think yeah, I personally am very happy to look at that data. I'm not just going to dismiss it out of hand. I'm going to analyze it. Uh, now, I guess the, the question you're raising there is, should other scientists be looking at this with some degree of seriousness? And yeah, there's, there's an issue there. There is this stigma in science. Uh, but I think that stigma is, is largely well-founded because of all the ridiculous stuff that comes along with, with UFOs. Uh, and I think if there was some good evidence, then people like the UAP task force would have actually brought it forward and actually done something with it. Where, where, where are our top physicists? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you're a top physicist. Well, you're a physicist. I don't know where you are in the, the world rankings, but. Uh... I'm actually a mathematician, but I don't know anybody in the top physics community who knows what the hell's going on here. Yeah. Well, nobody knows what's going on. So it's not like, you know, they've been given the evidence and they've studied it and they've determined that, that there's nothing is going on. It's that the evidence, the evidence isn't really very good. Well, is the fact that our top people don't have the evidence indicative of something? Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think from my perspective, I think it's more likely that the evidence doesn't rise to the level where it would, you would be able to justify bringing in outside people. Now, if it's something, you know, like the, the Manhattan project where they brought in a whole bunch of scientists, you know, then there's a lot of motivation there. Uh, there was a lot of reason to believe that, you know, the race for the atomic bomb was a very important matter, matter of, uh, of national survival. But with, with UFOs, you know, the base level of evidence doesn't really seem to be there. We don't have this, this, this huge push that would be justified if there was actually this evidence of new technology or new physics out there, which would be worth trillions of dollars. Uh, instead, we get these stupid little programs with, with $22 million. Well, it doesn't inspired. make any sense. It, it seems like they might even not really be, they, they almost might be decoys for relatively small amounts of money. Are you familiar with the history that brought in the great topologist Solomon Lefschetz and Bryce DeWitt uh, and Peter Higgs and Lewis Witten together where there were two very weird efforts, one nakedly anti-gravity um, by a guy named Babson. Uh, no, I'm not really familiar with that, but I've heard you talk about it before, the, uh, the kind of this secret gravity research. Yeah. So there, there, was, there was a very weird thing whereby in the 1950s, 
there was like if you look at Feynman's uh, popular books, he talks. Uh, there's a story mm-hmm. called "Any Questions," where he gets a black eye in a bar that was frequented by bookies and prostitutes. Yeah, what, I read it. what he's actually talking about is that he was going to Buffalo from Cornell to mm-hmm. an aerospace company to deliver lectures. And there's this weird confluence between aerospace, so what's known as the general, the golden age of general relativity, and all of these top scientists that's never made a whit of sense, which almost certainly seems like there was some sort of program run through a couple of individuals named Babson and Bainson, which is extremely confusing, to bring a small cadre of leading scientists to discuss something that sounds like anti-gravity in the guise of discussing general relativity anew. Right. And I would dearly like to know what that program actually was. Yeah. And I would like more of us to be talking openly because we know, for example, that Solomon Lefschetz was, was affiliated with this crazy gravity research foundation. Is there a bunch of like classified documents about that that people have been trying to get, or is there just nothing there? Because it seems to me like David Kaiser at MIT, the physicist and historian, would probably be the best person to answer mm-hmm. that. I've never gotten at this, nor have I put in the time or the energy. I've just noted that for some reason, suddenly in the 1950s, general relativity, which had been asleep since the late teens, wakes up as a field. There's a conference at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which Feynman attends, which all of this seems to be spurred by two individuals, um, one of which creates the what's called the Research Institute for Advanced Study to make it sound like the Institute for Advanced Study. The other is something called like something the Institute for the Study of Physical Fields at UNC North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. And there's some weird thing between the Martin aircraft company, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, a bunch of these sorts of things. And I never even heard anyone talk about them to put it all together until I talked to Kaiser and I said, am I losing my mind? He's like, no, no, no. This is this really weird history where the great, I mean, just to put a a weird period on it, the, the top mind in theoretical physics is the son of the leading anti-gravity researcher from the 1950s. It's a very bizarre state of affairs. I guess you got to try to think what, what might have actually happened there. And from my perspective, it kind of, the most likely hypothesis, I'm just floating this out there, is that there was a, a research program into something that was quite extraordinary, uh, but it didn't pan out uh, in the same way that uh, Project Stargate was a research program into remote viewing. You know, this is obviously a bit more hard science, but it was something they thought, oh, the Russians are going to be looking into this type of thing. We too should you know, form a working group, maybe two working groups, and try to figure out if we can figure out what they figured out. And they look into it, but you know, the same way that Stargate, nothing happened, nothing happens there. But it's classified, stays classified, and it's a mystery. I mean, no technology that we know of is anti-gravity. Nothing apparently came from it, unless there's this weird parallel track of science that is going on. Anti-gravity may be a head fake, which means that it's really just post space time physics. Mm -hmm. It's now become very fashionable in theoretical physics to say that space time is the problem and that it's doomed as a concept and that what we're looking for is the successor to Einstein's sort of fabric for reality. Um, it may be that anti-gravity is a really bad name for something to make it sound junky, but that what we're really talking about, and particularly the presence of Lefschetz is very interesting here, um, that what we may be discussing is a post-Ramanian or pseudo-Ramanian understanding of, of space-time, just a geometric replacement. Yeah, and I heard you talk on uh, Brian Keating's show about how you thought that might be um, kind of related to UFOs in a way, and that uh, whatever the UFOs are kind of represents a someone who has access to that higher level understanding that's above it space could be. time. Yeah, or it could be uh, that it's all nonsense and it's all disinformation. I mean, look, I, I'm very open minded about this. 
Uh, I was in a discussion with Sam Harris not too long ago, and he said that one of the characteristics that he had noticed that differentiate us is that he tends to be very closed on the way in relative to my openness on the way in, but that he notes that mm -hmm. I don't tend to slide all the way down the slippery slope to say, yeah, it's definitely aliens. And what I'm trying to do is really to keep that possibility open that what we're talking about is we're talking about a science program, not a technology program, not a defense program that has techno technological and military and security implications. See, yeah, I, I, I'm all for keeping everything on the table. And yeah. this is part of my, my general philosophy of investigation. I'm glad to hear that. Is that I would, uh, I would keep like, you know, uh, some kind of advanced technology, new physics, uh, or, uh, or aliens, or even things like, um, you know, say the simulation hypothesis, you know, perhaps these things are a glitch in the matrix. You know, that's, it's a possibility. Uh, okay, it doesn't that's... seem like there's any good evidence for it, but it's something that, you know, why not consider that? Why not have all these things in the mix? Because if you're closing off various things, you might close off things by accident. Okay. So look, there are minor branches of, of the decision tree that I find so remote as to say that I, you know, I really don't want to spend time on it, but what, what sure, I'm you asking spend time on it, <laughs> what but you keep it around. Well, I guess what I'm asking is do you see any banal branches of this decision tree that are still alive? I mean, yeah. Well, I oh, mean, yeah? it, I, I think that there's a very big branch of the decision tree that uh, does not involve, um, you know, extraordinary flying craft. I think there's a, a, a large possibility. Uh, there's a large possibility that uh, all the UFO encounters have essentially um, you know, simple explanations. Uh, and, and in those simple explanations, I would include things like experimental aircraft by the US government and perhaps occasionally experimental aircraft uh, by other governments. But the, the vast majority are going to be things like, uh, like airborne clutter, people misidentifying things, uh, people having you know, hallucinations from stress, like fighter pilots who have been in the air for a real long time, uh, things like that. And I think that's, that is definitely the avenue of this decision tree of what things might be that, that I go down. And I think it's likely to be a decision tree that has very many leaves. And it's probably not the right, the right way of putting it because it's still, thing, it's still like you end up at one leaf, but you don't. There's all these different things. You're going to end up at a branch that has lots of leaves. And all of these things are contributing to what we actually see. People, people see things that are optical illusions, like this triangle thing, like a DC-8 looks exactly like uh, a triangle because it has a light on each wingtip and a red one in the middle, and it looks like a triangle with three lights on the corners and a red thing in the middle. So that probably accounts for a bunch of those. There's lots and lots of different things. And uh, then there's also this, this other layer of it, which is this, this government... Um, you know, the, the pressure from the invisible college, these people who are really into it, and the government, people in government who are either you know, somewhat corrupt, they're getting kickbacks or whatever, and the people pay them to do things, or, or they just have interest themselves. There's all these complicated layers of things going on that doesn't really involve some vast new hidden parallel track of science or a defense department like science program or, or aliens or time travelers or anything like that. So I, I would keep those things as possibilities, but it seems like to me, everything is probably going to be in this, this big old branch over here. Okay. Airborne clutter. Like I have this feeling that we're well beyond airborne clutter, not to say that I do not, I do not. <laughs> It's the number of the one thing that they list on the UAP report. Uh, it's also the, the one thing that they, they actually solved was a, a balloon. And it's something that Scott Bray mentioned in the hearing. Uh, this, this is something that comes up as, as a problem over and over again. People see airborne clutter. It's too far away. Okay. They, mentioned, they mentioned four branches. They mentioned airborne clutter. They mentioned atmospheric effects. They mentioned our technology and they mentioned the technology of others and i've gone through this in terms of the first two are things unintentionally in the air the next things are 
Not the first first one includes drones, uh, which actually is an intentional thing. That's what I'm trying to say. That's clutter. not airborne clutter. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the point is, is that the first two branches, the first question is things that are unintentionally in the air or cl clutter and atmosphere. Right. The, the next branch is things produced by sentient life that are intended to be in the air. And that branches right. into us, not us, and then other. And other, therefore, is alarmingly interesting because it's not airborne clutter. It's not unintentionally in the air. It's intentionally in the air. And it's not us, and it's not anybody known to us. So my question to you, Mick, is do you believe that there's enough mylar balloons, swamp gas, Venus on the horizon, et cetera, et cetera, to effectively remove just about everything from wow. can candidacy? I wish you wouldn't say uh, swamp gas because that's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's a, a red herring, a straw man. Let me throw it out. Only, I, it, it was used to uh, explain one case in the, the 50s or 60s, and it, it became like a joke in the same way that seagulls have become Sorry. a joke. Sorry. So, Look, I just got yeah, here. My lab balloons, not... but no, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's all seagulls and mylar balloons. Can I say that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's all airborne clutter. Sea, seagulls, mylar balloons, like plastic bags and drones, uh, are the things that were in the the airborne uh, clutter thing uh, by by the government. I, that does not explain everything. I mean, I think there's even categories that they haven't listed there, like distant planes, which are a huge source. Of, uh, of UFOs. My sense of it is just from people coming forth out of the woodwork to me, the stories I've now heard of encounters are so far beyond mm -hmm. plastic bags and seagulls Yeah, that I, and again, I'm not, if you told me that there was like a huge theater troupe that was out to convince us that this stuff was real, sure. But I, I can't process i don't think there's enough mylar balloon in the world to explain all the weird stuff going on no i, d I don't think they're all things like that i mean there's a, there's a bunch of other things as well there's just simple optical illusions like a lot of what, what people see they see at night and they describe things like large things moving overhead or a giant craft uh, and people's perceptions of things can be completely off from reality uh, and, and i think you know, you've got to really you know, this is this is kind of a sore point in ufology is this this huge discrepancy between the eyewitness testimony and the recorded evidence uh things like videos you know a lot of these encounters happen during the day and people will describe seeing things in daytime but somehow they're always too surprised to actually take a take a video or when they do take a video it doesn't really show something like what they were describing because they say oh it was a little bit further away now so I think eyewitness testimony, whilst it's an important part of the equation, you really have to uh, take that with the possibility that you know, a lot of it, if not, I wouldn't say all of it, but uh, it depends what we're talking about, isn't really very reliable evidence. And the fact that it's not backed up with, with hard evidence, with, uh, with, with data, with recordings, is a, is a problem. The major point in favor of the debunkers is the fact that we've never gotten good evidence. I've seeded that to you from the beginning. Now, the thing that I'm surprised by mm -hmm. is it feels to me like you're trying to take a twin size fitted sheet of explanation and fit it over a king size mystery yeah. and the corner keeps popping off and you're pointing out that you can fit one or two corners. And my, my claim is, is that I think that that ship sort of sailed. And well, I don't mean to be rude about it. I, I, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Let me get it out. I think that we're still in range of some serious disinformation. And to your point, yes, I understand very well that we can pile up different explanations. There are mylar balloons and confused um, sightings of seagulls and et cetera, et cetera. But my claim is that that's the that that works well enough for a twin size mm -hmm. bed. There is a real mystery here, and the real mystery is what explains this amount of indirect evidence with this little direct evidence where 
I only find yeah. out about the indirect evidence when I'm willing to put myself in a position for debunkers to ridicule, which is to say, I'm not dismissing this out of hand the well, way I was two years ago. I've got a hypothesis on, on sure. that, uh, which is one I think I've shared before, but uh, it's basically kind of like you know the cream rising to the top. And what I mean by that is that uh, I, I've talked to uh, people who are air traffic controllers, senior air traffic controllers. I ask them, you know, how many times do pilots you know, report UFOs? or talk about them, you know, whilst they're actually flying. So it's not like, you know, it's not like they're worried about it when they get back home, they, they see something and they will ask, you know, what is this thing over there? How many times do you get genuine uh, reports of UFOs? And this guy being the air traffic controller for like 10 years, he, he didn't have any. I think these things are pretty rare, but if you take something that's pretty rare, as you know, like law of large numbers, and you spread that over even the what 380 million people in the US, you're going to get um, some hits. You're going to get people who think they saw something and become convinced that they saw something when they actually didn't see exactly what they thought they saw. And uh, what we see is this, this cohort of people, this large group of people, of you know, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people who are really just a minuscule kind of tip of the spear of all these possible sightings. These are the best ones. You know, we've got this 144 sightings from the Navy. These are just the ones that have risen to the top. And it looks like a lot. You say, oh, we've got 144 cases. It's 144 cases out of millions of hours of, uh, of pilot training. Sure, but if I, if I ask you to just live inside your own construct, what are the five that have risen to the top of Mick West's that is a puzzling, disturbing story for which I do not have an explanation. Like if you were to have to give your own assessment using the cream theory, what are, what is the top five that have troubled you? Uh, well, anything that's not resolvable, but you know, there's, there's two points, two points to that question. One is like, you know, my personal experience is I've never seen a UFO and you've probably never seen a UFO. I don't know. Maybe you have, but uh, most people haven't seen a UFO. 1988, so what we're talking about I briefly saw a tiny speck of light that was traversing the heavens stop and reverse course. I had no idea how high it was because you can't tell distance. Uh -huh. And it seemed like it was a satellite, but it seemed like it's too late at night. It's, it would never have risen to any strong level of interest because I, I'm not a sky watcher, so I don't know what's normal and, and what behaviors things have. Certainly, yeah. I would never ex call myself an experiencer. That's not even a word that I knew. But my question to you is, assume that you and I have never seen something. I assume that Kurt has never seen something that is dispositive. What are the top five things that you've encountered that... Like specifics, man. Not, not. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, what? Uh, the, it's it's difficult because, yeah, you know, I've got this this general theory of ufology is that all UFOs exist in the low information zone, which is where you know it's too far away to determine what things are, and the things that I've been unable to resolve are things like that. Yeah, you know, I guess the number one thing uh, would be the uh, command of David Fravers' encounter with the white Tic Tac. Which is backed up to some degree by uh, his his uh, wingman uh, Alex Dietrich, who saw something from above. So they they have this compelling account of an encounter with a a, a flying tic tac that they got into a kind of a dogfight with, and that's kind of a difficult one for me to uh, explain what it is. You know, I I don't think that you know, some kind of alien craft rises very high to the, the list of possibilities, but I don't really have a very good set of explanations before, uh, um, around that. And I would, you know, honestly, I would struggle to, to find more cases that are similar to that in my own personal so experience. So that really far and away, what you would say would be, that's number one and there's nothing in second place? No, I mean, there's, 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 there's lots of eyewitness accounts uh, that sound incredible. You, know, you can go back through through history and look at these things. Like there's the uh, like, say if you take the the uh, the the Robert Salas uh, Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana uh, account on face value, you know that's bizarre. Yeah, you know, uh, nuclear weapons being shut off uh, whilst a UFO hovers outside the gate. 
But I think you know, in that one, you examine the story and it, it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. But yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe you can send some people my way who are very convincing accounts and see, and perhaps I would. Well, I just, we brought up the Brandon story and to be honest with mm. you, that one flipped me out because, yeah, you know, it's like, it's, there's no part of me that wanted to call Brandon a liar. And yeah. there was no part of he me told that wanted to call to him. It didn't sound like a burning man. I've been up for three days, dehydrated on every psychedelic known demand story. And it didn't mm -hmm. sound like anything. And, you know, and to be horribly honest about it, the TV show that's built around the Skinwalker Ranch thing has the effect mm -hmm. of turning anything that happens on that show into something that can be lampooned because it's being somewhat sensationalized as a commercial product yeah. but clearly they have shown on that show things that are their attempts to say oh look there's a ufo right there right yeah multiple well you, you shake your head my well, question the, 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 the ufos they show are things like little white dots in the sky that aren't doing anything spectacular and they're probably planes or birds or something like that they really haven't shown anything convincing you had this point about the low information zone. Assume that I've understood. Yeah, exactly. Well, what they've been trying to claim is that they've triangulated something in the general sense of triangulation, not the specific sense. Yeah. I, where, you know, they're showing extraordinary readings here. And I don't know how they're doing their baselines. Like, I don't know in general, if you pass current through earth, um, how, how unusual that is. So I, I can't watch the show and learn anything as a guy who's too far removed from what they're doing out there. But I think what I am trying to say is I have now been compelled that I've had so many weird conversations with grownups mm -hmm. who are putting way too much specificity on this. Once they get over the fact that you're not coming to get them and make fun of them, they are seemingly like always looking over their shoulder because they don't want to be considered kooky. Yeah, it's a little bit like, you. <laughs> what? This is how they get you. This is, uh... oh, sorry, go ahead. Good. Has Brandon told any of you that he's in possession of high information evidence, but he just can't release it for whatever reason? Uh, not in terms of secret evidence. He keeps saying that, that they've got loads of, you know, terabytes of data and that, that they have some like things like actual specific triangulations uh, with two cameras with known angles that, that, that they've done. But, you know, I keep asking him and he keeps promising and he never delivers. So to me, it sounds to me like you're saying that there's only one really top drawer incident that is meeting your levels for saying that's really interesting. And what I'm trying to say is there are people who've come forward where, which I can discuss like Brandon and there are people who've come forward that I won't discuss that sound yeah. quite a bit like this, making claims that seem entirely inconsistent with sober military, just the facts kind of straight ahead orientation. And, yeah. and, and in particular, I have a pretty good sense of when people are limelight seeking or people are limelight avoiding. And a lot of these people seem like limelight avoiders. Like Bob Lazar. See, I have almost no knowledge of Bob Lazar. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's not like I, no, watch, I, know. I understand. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I vaguely himself. know who Graham Hancock is and something about chariots of the God. I, I don't know anything. It, this is not my world. No, Bob, Bob Lazar is, you know, I guess a, a divisive figure in the UFO community. And uh, uh, a, a lot of people just think he's a fraud, including me. But he presents himself as very much limelight avoiding, even though he has ended up on various shows. But he, he always says, like, it's very, he's very reluctant to talk about it. And if you talk to him, apparently, people who have talked to him will say he's very limelight avoiding. But, you know, I, I, I do not want to kind of draw parallels between those and the people you've talked to because they're completely different people. But being limelight avoiding, I don't think is necessarily a a factor that uh, increases my confidence in somebody's story. Yeah, but to be to be to push back rather rather forcefully, when you have a secret that is deranging your life, there's both an urge to purge and an urge to avoid. Mm -hmm. And you see both of these things in certain people, which is that they're trying to get back home to normal. 
you know, they've been exposed to some piece of information, you know, to be blunt, war used to create divisions where somebody had seen war and somebody hadn't. And how do they live under the same roof now that one of them has seen something that the other can't even imagine, you know? So if this in fact breaks you out of polite society, um, it's entirely consistent to have somebody with a basic limelight avoiding personality who's going to keep going back to the well because at some level they're trying to say, I'm not crazy. And I, and I, you know, just to be very clear about it, part of my desire to stick up for people out here is that I watch the power to silence that comes from stigma and shame, in particular stigma and shame as entertainment. Um, yeah. And the idea of laughing at people like the the use of the words clown buffoon debunk um lol rotfl it most people can't stand up to this and it really bugs me that an entire group in the world thinks it's completely okay to destroy an individual who dares raise a voice and that's the non-science reason I'm out here in UFO territory is, is that, which is I can't stand basically bullying and gaslighting of people who've seen something, who want answers, who want to ask questions. And then somehow it's like there was a secret meeting where everybody decided the truth and you weren't part of it. And the basic attitude towards people who engage in this kind of gaslighting is F you. Science has your back. These people don't belong in our minions, uh, in, in, in our community, and they have to be driven out. Peter Daszak is in a very serious position trying to orchestrate the idea that only um, you know, racists entertain the lab leak hypothesis. Everybody should want to know what the hell he was doing in the Wuhan Institute of Virology with Defense Department funding. Conversely, when we turn over to the UFO community, You know, the issue is I don't want people who have seen something or who have data scared anymore. And it's very important. Who are they scared of? I mean, you you keep talking about this debunking community, but who exactly are you referring to? I mean, I'm not a person who mocks people. So that just comes across to me as playing, I'll be blunt, that comes across to me as playing dumb. No, I think that lots of people are... No, no, I'm, I'm, it's a genuine question. It's a genuine question because there's not very many UFO debunkers out there. I, I think it's a, it's a really disingenuous sounding question. And I, 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 may, have, I may have you wrong, Nick, but... Are you including in a, me as part of this, this I don't, debunking well, community? Who I can tell you that I find your interaction unpleasant. It's like I've never, I've never said... I've never said anything like this is real, it's true, or did you hear about the Nimitz incident or, you know, with the, these new cameras, they can tell that, like, that's not my energy. My energy is, oh, I was lied to. I was lied to about many things. For example, psychedelics. I was told that, you know, acid would uh, destroy your, your, your body and, and, and your brain. And it turns out that it's very well tolerated. Um, and even micrograms, you know, you, the the dose needed to kill you, I think, is not known because it, it's so well tolerated. When I found out that I had been lied to about psychedelics, I was very angry because I had taken on the trust that the government knows what it's talking about and that these were dangerous substances. In the case of UFOs, I've been lied to. It is very clear that a lot of very smart people have feel that they have had their lives destroyed over taking this seriously as a topic and not by me what not by me yeah perhaps by their their colleagues and perhaps by the 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 government why do i have the the impression that you police ufos uh i wouldn't say that Uh, what do you mean when you say that eric what what do you mean i forget what our last interaction was mick but somehow i tried to say something general and you yeah. tried to bring it back to like Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon. Um, and I don't remember what that was, but. Well, does it, it, look, it doesn't much matter, but I think what I'm trying to get at is 
are you unaware that people feel that they've been ridiculed and have had their credibility shredded because of something that they they sincerely believe they came in contact no. with as either data or a primary experience? Well, you know, I all right, let's let's kind of in a way shelve that that question a little bit because I think we can perhaps divide uh, the experiences into two groups. Uh, one group would be the experiencers who are sensitive and would get upset by that type of thing and you know wouldn't like uh, that and then the other ones are the people who you know they don't don't uh, don't really care people like david fravor they wait, come wait. out he no. didn't have his life ruined he's, he's given this extensive discussion uh, of uh, of his encounter and nothing happened to him his career was just fine okay well now, uh, now we're in territory where i can map this very well no things did happen to him. i don't need to know him perfect Personally, I've never met him. I've never had a conversation with him. But I can tell you two things that have happened. One thing is, is that people have treated him as a nutter. And the other thing is that people have celebrated him as a, uh, as a truth-seeking hero. Both of these things happen to you out here. And it's pretty disturbing when people treat you as a nutter and you're saying something that's pretty sober, like, I was minding my business when the following thing happened to me and I'm not responsible for it. Do you have the sense that he's lying? No, I don't. Uh, I do not have the sense he's lying. Most people who have some kind of experience, I do not think that they are lying. Uh, okay. But people often say that I am saying that people lie. I think, you know, he's telling what he, he thinks, what he thought happened. I think his memory may have changed over time. Uh, and his initial perception may have been faulty. But so you I have no perception that people are paying a personal price for saying I was in contact with data, I've seen data, or sure. I was I, like, I had a direct experience. All of them. All of them. Everyone's being prevented from coming forward. No one's like you know, got the uh, the cojones to actually step up. You know, I don't want to like you know belittle people who 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 have genuine trauma uh, from these encounters and their reaction to the encounters, but it doesn't explain the complete lack of uh, this type of thing of people actually coming forward well i mean nobody came forward from cointel pro and that was a pretty large operation to stay hidden i mean there's a a trope at well, the moment it, that the government can't they were legally required not to come forward and that if you have a situation in which um the government is alleged to keep a secret somebody now says oh i don't believe three people can keep a secret much less thousands as if d-day was never planned i mean this is just it's sort of this willful playing dumb that I don't understand. It doesn't seem like, to be honest, it doesn't seem dumb. like you. I understand your point. I understand your point. You know, this this kind of this chilling effect uh, yeah. of 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 uh, mockery. Yeah, do but, you not you know, see I don't that? think that what I am doing is mockery, and you know, I don't really see um, a huge amount of evidence of some kind of organized group of people doing it. You, you talk about this uh, the debunking community. But I don't think the debunking community is really having this big of an effect on people's lives. So you do see the snide remarks or the disparagement against people who come out either saying that they've witnessed something firsthand or that they just want to investigate the phenomenon, for example, Avi Loeb. So you do see that there's disesteem at times from no, a yeah. nebulous source. Yeah, it's like I talked about before, like it's something that's always been there in UFOs. It's this stigma which uh, hinders uh, genuine investigation. But unfortunately, it's something that arises naturally from the somewhat uh, ridiculous nature of, of some of the stories that are in ufology and some of the things like the, the hoaxes and the, the silly photos. But yeah, it's a problem that is an impediment to serious research. And it's, you know, it, it's something that I've increasingly tried to avoid uh, when I've been talking to people and, you know, I get feedback all the time that, you know, I come across as being, uh, you know, perhaps abrasive or perhaps, uh, seeming like I'm mocking and I take, you know, Eric's, uh, perception to heart here that perhaps, you know, my, my, uh, discussions with people and my encounters with people are not always, uh, uh enjoyable. And I perhaps I don't mind should, not enjoyable I should try to part. improve that. Yeah. I, the thing is. I came very close to blocking your account. Not, it didn't make me happy because I feel like you have a lot to contribute. And I really do value getting rid of 
um, the idea that nothing can explain these videos because I think that's completely preposterous. You know, we're in a world in which the Matrix and Star Wars have shown us things far more interesting than these videos. And the idea that you can't create these videos any other way is ridiculous. Yeah. Now that said, I just don't, it's more like the role you're playing is, is like a border collie keeping these people away mm -hmm. from chemtrails and flat earth. It's like if the conserved quantity, imagine, for example, that you gave up, grew up in a religious family. I know nothing about your family. I'm not making this as a claim. I grew up Catholic. Okay. It's entirely possible that in a, in a family in which mythology is rammed down your throat, you better believe and only bad people don't believe that you pick up an energy, which is I hate forced belief. And I hate it when stories become so big that people crawl inside of a story and lose their family and lose their mind. I've, I've met people who've been in a cult-like environment. Yeah. And their key thing is we've got to make sure that we don't let any cult-like beliefs in the door. And then I've grown up you know, myself as an atheist in an atheistic family for like five generations. And my feeling is in part that that relentless focus on let's not believe anything that can't be just demonstrated in a lab has its own set of problems. Um, it's very hard to do the cutting edge research if you can never believe in your own imagination enough to let it run wild for a while. You know, and my personal belief is that we should all have a creative side and a debunking side living inside of our brains where we're debunking our creative impulse. Yeah. Because it's me. in part tied to like ego, you know? And it, it, the issue that I'm having though is, is that the skeptic energy and the scientific energy, it, things have tilted far enough with, the, with what we now believe to be true, that it's really important to me that we stop scaring pilots who may, like if, you, if your explanation is that somebody's under a lot of stress or that somebody needs a psychological workup because they might be having a psychotic break or that somebody may be hallucinating, a lot of the explanations that may not involve UAP um, are of a personal sort of psychological, characterological nature. And to somebody mm -hmm. who might have as their employment plan that they're going to fly commercial aircraft after their stint in the Navy, they're not going to want to come forward if your explanation uh, is effect effectively that these were phosphines or the person may have, you know, had a, a flashback from uh, an acid trip from a few years ago. It, I want people to feel comfortable saying what they've seen without this extra yeah. layer. Well, we now kind of have that in some uh, some arenas, like specifically the Navy training ranges, where we've, we've got a couple of these videos from. They now have specific guidelines in place for reporting uh, you know, this type of encounter. And they're actually encouraged to do it now. We also have with the FAA uh, a strong encouragement uh, with pilots to report uh, drone sightings, and they don't need to be necessarily identified as a specific type of drone. And so we're actually getting a bunch of UFO reports uh, because of this this emphasis on on, on looking at, uh, at drones. You know, things that essentially I saw a, a it's white a happy wall accident a because drone. of drones becoming a, a threat. That is a happy accident. Yeah, but the Navy thing was a specific response uh, to the UFO. Uh, thing it was it was something that they recognized that there was this stigma and they tried to they tried to remove the stigma and that that's that's a laudable thing and I, I think that was you know it's showing results let, let me try to put a, a different sheen on it so, so uh, last attempt to make the point I am very much more careful. I want to f figure out how to phrase this. I am much more careful when I hear somebody talking about chemtrails, for example, if they come from the black American community, mm. than if they don't. And I'm much more understanding if somebody comes from a radical progressive family that went through the McCarthy era and they don't trust the government. So in other words, when particular groups of people are repeatedly lied to and manipulated 
and have a different history than the rest of the country. I tend to take their fears much more seriously. If you went through the Tuskegee medical experiment, it's not that crazy to worry about what's in a vaccine. If you didn't go through the Tuskegee medical experiment, if your community wasn't subjected to that, you may have a very different sense that, you know, something's going on. Or if you're aware that we've experimented with biological agents involuntarily against people in subway stations, there's all sorts of weird stuff that we've gotten up to. I forget there was a ship that maybe was supposed to disperse something so it could be recorded. The history of secret government behavior is not a great history, whether it's Operation Ajax or Operation Condor, who knows what. And the pressure not to question these things because it's a conspiracy theory really bothers me because we have a group that is simultaneously engaging in conspiracies and not clearing up things that they could clear up, which does feel that personal destruction is a good way to keep secrets. And I guess what I'm asking you is, can you be a bit more charitable to people who've been lied to? Okay. Uh, that's you know, a perfectly reasonable request, I think. And uh, yes, yes, I think I can. And you know, I'd like to invite other people who are watching this to give me feedback on you know, whether they like, you know, not necessarily just agree, disagree, but like in what way could I do better? In what way could the debunking community do better? And what specifically should we do? Because I, I interview people uh, who have had experiences. You know, a number of uh, people like, you know, say Kevin Day, one of the guys off the Nimitz, and uh, Gary Voorhis, another guy from the Nimitz Encounters, different ship. Uh, but yeah, I'm nice to them. I'm not mocking them. What a lot of what I'm doing in my just day-to-day -day stuff isn't like questioning people's eyewitness accounts. I very rarely actually take cases uh, where it's just an eyewitness account, simply because there's not a lot you can do with it. And it often, it's, it gets very contentious because people are very emotional about their things. So a lot of what I do is just simply the nuts and bolts type thing of looking at uh, uh, individual videos and uh, photos and things like that. So, you know, if I could do something that was better in terms of, of outreach to people who have had experiences, um, yes. But I think it's really more about kind of, in a way, avoiding that type of confrontation because there's not a lot you can do with someone who just has an eyewitness experience, someone who you know, tells you, I saw this. This, this black triangle, you know, I've talked to quite a few of them, you know, kind of online on, on Twitter and there's only so far you can go. You could perhaps like perhaps do a, a hypothesis to what it might be. You can listen to their, their explanations and you can ask them questions about, you know, what angular size do you think it would be? Like how many hand widths would it be? And you know, what time it was and where were you? But at some point, you know, you enter the low information zone and there's, there's not much further you can go. And I, I generally just say, well, I'm, I'm, I can't really help you. I don't mock them. I don't like make fun of them. And in general, I don't, I don't mock people. So, you know, I'm sure there are things I can do to improve, but I, I don't really accept your kind of characterization of me of being part of this very dangerous uh, community. Uh, you, you know, I think you, you described it as an abomination that we need to get rid of the uh, debunking community in, in your, your, your last, last thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that the point is that these people are not necessarily bunko artists. Yeah, but that's not I think me. what you're not, that's I think not what me. you're not figuring out is when you come at something from the point of view of debunking it, right? But what you're really I don't. That's what I was saying from the very start is that you know, with UFOs, what I do is come at it from the perspective of investigating it to try to figure out what that thing is. If someone comes to me with uh, a story, of what they they saw, but you don't use the word. I, I'm an investigator. I, I'm moving away from it. For oh, you're the moving away. I said okay. at the start. Okay. Yeah, that. Uh, um, yeah, what's his name? The, the the pilot Ryan Graves. Yeah, he told me he didn't want to talk to me because they had debunk. You know, I always try to. I've been trying to reframe debunking as uh, a positive thing because it is about investigating things to see whether they are true or false. It's not about working towards a certain result. Well, may, maybe think about it from the following. I understand that. One of the things that's very interesting 
to some of us who do commentary uh, on social issues is that people who are employed by legacy media outfits react to mm -hmm. anybody who makes a living as an individual not attached to a legacy media outfit. They refer to these people as grifters in order to give the idea that you can trust Harper's in the Atlantic, but if somebody is telling you something on the internet, then it's probably nonsense. I think that what you have to understand is, is that bunk and bunko and the idea of fooling people. I appreciate that you're moving away from it, but maybe a repudiation of the energy around that is really necessary because it's one thing to say, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to use that less. A lot of the fun that comes from skepticism is mixing in this dunking and dragging. And whether or not one is actually doing the dunking and dragging, just let me, let me get to the end of this. Whether one is actually doing the dunking and dragging or whether one is painting a bullseye on a target for someone else to execute, I think is really kind of the issue. And my well, feeling I, of, go on. No, I, I, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not the snark and the debunking and the dragging. Like, and you're saying I'm part, painting a target on uh, things by, by actually investigating it and figuring out what it is and then other people can make fun of it. That, that's, you know, that, is that on me that, that I investigate something and it turns out not to be true and therefore other people I don't uh, perhaps I, mock whoever came up with the thing originally. I don't think that well, all one has to do is to say, look, I really don't want these people ridiculed. <laughs> well, I, I can't like add a disclaimer at the end of all my they investigations is that don't make fun of people because no, of no, this. no, look, people there, are, there, are bunk, there are Bunko artists, right? There are people who are trying to deceive other people, let's say for profit. Okay. Sure. I think that it is reasonable to return fire against such people at a proportionate level. Right. A fair game, I think. Uh... Well, to a point, right? I mean, you know, you, I well, think you also... What? If someone is a charlatan and they, they are basically selling nonsense for money, then yes, I, d I think they deserve to be. If somebody's a charlatan, the, the, the community has the right to drive their costs in a particular way up to a point, right? But, you know, what we're seeing here in my estimation is that there are a lot of people who confide in me and say that they are frightened or they say, I really appreciate you entering into this space because I couldn't even talk to my own family. And there's just sort of no emotional affect that I see in you mm. when I'm like, I believe that you and I both know this to be true. Uh, that could be false because I'm making the assumption that we both know this. But I have now heard from so many people that they're frightened by what they experienced or what they saw. That for you to say, well, like, who's, it? who's frightened? Who's experienced? Nothing bad happened to David Fravor. I don't need to know David Fravor to know that lots of good and lots of bad That's have happened. That's not what happened. I said. Pardon me? I said that there, are, there must be some people who are not frightened by what they saw. Well, there are people said, who are divided into two and excited. Trenches, like yeah, but, there's, there's people who do, are deeply affected by it, but there's people who are just simply will see it as a scientific observation and they'll be able to report it. We don't see very many people. Almost nobody I know who's not independently wealthy can afford to say, oh, that, that was interesting. Would, would you want a surgeon operating on your child if uh, the, the surgeon had had lots of discussions with aliens? Sure. I mean, yeah, I would. It's a perfectly normal thing for someone to see something in the sky and think it's this weird thing. This happens all the time. If somebody you know, told me that they were abducted by aliens and that they wanted to operate on my kid, I'll be honest, that would tutor yeah, my no, prior to say, uh, I don't want to take that risk that this person... There might be a line. Yeah. Yeah, but like simply seeing a craft in the sky, that is, that's a different thing entirely. I think that's a very understandable thing to happen to people and there will be inevitably some people who have some kind of misperception or illusion that uh you know it isn't doesn't deserve mockery certainly not it's, it's a perfectly understandable thing and you know I, t I tell people this when i talk to them that yeah i can see how this Maybe might we've taken this even far. even that is a very sensitive thing even that uh they they, they see that as being um dismissive 
so it's, it's, it's difficult. And like I say, I try to stay away from that and type of thing. To your point, I think it's completely reasonable to say we may have to dismiss some things that are very deeply personally held as beliefs and people may get very injured. But the fact is we can't afford to be taking this as some super serious threat, let's say, to our nuclear arsenal because uh, Mrs. O'Connell uh, thought she saw uh, a cigar-shaped object hovering in her backyard for half a second. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's real serious issues in ufology. There are unidentified flying things uh, that people have seen, and we should investigate what they are, all the reasons why people are seeing these things. And I, I agree, like, let's, let's get away from the stigma uh, of it, and then we'll get closer to some resolution one way or another. I join with you on that, and uh, I think that's very positive. How is it practically that we can get rid of and get away from the stigma so what would it require mick i understand that you don't see yourself as contributing to the stigma yeah. but do you see that you could contribute to the removing of the stigma by let's say tweeting a repudiation of the stigma uh, no <laughs> i think i'm a small fish and i think very few people are going to listen to me and you know the millions of people out there very few people are going to see what i say uh, i think it has to come from a higher level and I think we've already started to see it, like I said before, from the, the Navy uh, by having specific guidelines where people are required to report sightings. If someone is required to report a sighting, I think it, uh, it helps a great deal in removing the stigma. I think inevitably it's still going to be there to some degree. Uh, and you know, perhaps more people could talk about it when they make public appearances to discuss the topic that we should... Uh, you know, not have this stigma. And like if I'm on CNN again, then perhaps that is something that I should bring up. And, you know, I think I have, I have discussed that on, uh, on major media that uh, there is a stigma and it's, it's good that it's being diminished. So I don't think I'm going to be able to tweet out, you know, stop making fun of people and people will stop or people will feel better about it. But I think it's a slow process that we're part way I think along. they would. I don't think people would stop, but I think a large set of people would... By the way, just as just as there's excoriation to the people who come out as experiencers or people who investigate this topic, there is also fulmination directed at you and generally people who are skeptics. And I don't like that personally. I think that should stop. I think that 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 is yeah. Well, that that's something we haven't me. discussed, not even a single bit today. And I I hope people would, well, I hope people would do that less. And I imagine that if. I imagine that if Eric, that if you said something, not we're not trying to make this all into let's make public. No, no, no but I'm happy. I'm just hypothetically I'm saying, Eric, no, if I'm, you were to say I've something said... like, "Hey, please, please don't gang up on Mick. Mick is yeah. Mick has a role to play." Well, then people would the be problem, less. Don't worry about it. Same with Mick. No, but Kurt, the the problem that we have is is that I've been in Mick's general role historically. It's only been for like a year and a half or two years. I don't know. Same. What this is that I took this at all seriously at this I think level. So I don't think that my credentials uh, are great from the perspective of please. The way I see it is what Mick is doing, and I said this at the beginning, is a lot of it is yeoman's work. A lot of it is thankless. The skepticism is not that well rewarded. And it has to be done because we need people to come up with prosaic explanations in order, to, even if it's true, you'd want somebody doing exactly what Mick is doing to say, you know, this isn't evidence of speed. If, if you drag your finger over a picture of the Grand Canyon, that doesn't mean it's going hundreds of miles an hour, right? There's all sorts of stuff that is thankless that has to do with understanding photography and parallax and, and, and things that are, are not that much fun. The issue is when Mick is doing that, it's very important that people not go into, are you telling, are you calling me a liar mode? Because that's the inverse of that. And that's mm -hmm. harassing Mick. And, you know, again, I think Mick gets energy out of this from what I can tell, but it's not pleasant to be called names. And I've seen name calling directed at Mick and that's not right. Yeah. I think where Mick mistakes his importance <clears throat> is it really matters you're not that famous, except no. in this community. In this community, everybody knows who you are. And 
if you say something, it will be heard much differently than if you were to say something about food rationing. Right. But my point there is that the people in the community now are not going to be the ones reporting UFOs in the future because a uh, UFO sighting is pretty much a once in a lifetime thing. Uh, so the people you want to reach are all the other people who are outside the community who view it as being a, a silly topic that uh, they don't want to get involved with. So when they have a sighting, you know, people in the UFO community now, if they have a sighting, they're all like, oh, yeah, I saw this. They, they're posted on, on UFO Twitter. Some and them. that's, you know, largely my audience. But <clears throat> you want, to, how do we get that out? How do we get this message out to the, the broader audience? How do we reduce the stigma for the general public and for pilots? Yeah. I think, I think you can go a long way towards that because, to be honest, I think that you've been doggedly on this. And my fondest hope coming out of this discussion would be that we didn't have a dust up. We had a respectful conversation. People can hear the commonality and that people hear that Mick West believes that in the interest of science, we've got to make sure that people feel maximally comfortable. I do think some people are comfortable coming forward, but to be honest, there's another thing that's just about generosity of spirit. Like I was wrong mm -hmm. and a jerk to many people in the UFO community. And I'm sorry about that. And yeah. it's not just a question of they, you know, Eric Weinstein is so important that his condemnation of us on previous occasions really hurt us. It was that I was backed by an implicit army of science people who know that this topic is total garbage or think they know. And in being an agent for that, the same, the same way that I was an agent against LSD use because I thought it was hugely detrimental to the brain and to the body, I had just been very effectively propagandized. And there's no evidence that that's true. And there is no evidence, in my opinion, that the UFO community um, is you know, batshit crazy in, in, in reporting <laughs> these things that seem preposterous. And they still seem no. preposterous to me. Most of them are not. Yeah, uh, there are a few crazy people in there, but you know, there are crazy people everywhere. Everywhere, crazy people outside. Yeah, it's, it's I say that with the chemtrail community, it's like you know, there's all kinds of people in there. There's people with PhDs who believe in in chemtrails. There's people with PhDs who believe in in UFOs. You know, so it's uh, it's it's not like it's a group of ne'er do well idiots. It's just a, a cross section of society who happens to believe in a certain thing. And that should be respected. To wrap this all up, what is the one ask that you would want either of the other person or of society? So for example, if Avi Loeb, he says, okay, we need more evidence. There's something like extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, but extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding is a phrase that he likes to, to state. So he wants <laughs> more funding. That's extremely specific. Eric, what is it that you want? And Mick, what is it that you want with regard to this topic? I want something very clear. I want our top um, quantum field theorists, general relativists, and differential geometers read in to what data we have. And I would like them to be the representatives that actually get go through whatever data may exist as to whether anything is moving in ways that are inconsistent with our physics. I would like to figure out whether this is a physics issue or whether this is a defense security technology public policy issue. If it's physics, I want this turned over to the people who actually understand um, where the cutting edge of theoretical physics is and what's possible under the twin theories of the standard model in quantum field theory and general relativity and gravity theory. I would like to know whether or not we are seeing anything that is indicative of science beyond the science we have. That said, I think there's a small probability that something like that would be true. The other basic ask is that we stop destroying people um, through our skepticism, through our fears of bunk, through our fears of um, a conversation run out of control. It's really important to me that we recognize that gaslit people um, are everywhere and that we need to do as much as we can to restore that and whether the end of you know, Blue Book or 
something ushered in an era where we poo pooed all of this, even if it's even if it's nonsense or a cover story, that we start treating people who take this decision tree seriously and not force them to either say it's UFOs or a psyop, but recognize the possibility that we may be looking at a con a confluence of many different things and to allow people the freedom to behave as scientists and invite uh, anecdote, data, and disclosure so that the government really has to realize it's not their effing information. It belongs to all of us. And it's time to put this thing to bed in one way or another so that Mick actually gets some great data that he can go over uh, and see whether it's just uh, some, some, some bugs, seagulls, mylar balloons, and, and apertures or whether there's something really here. And I feel much emboldened that Mick, if he saw something extraordinary, uh, would be likely to say something. Yeah, uh, what he said, plus uh, what I want is to figure out what's going on. And I think the best way to do that is to refine the evidence. And I think the best way to refine the evidence is one, like uh, what Eric proposed is to read in experts on on uh, on various subject matters but also that doesn't always work there's been lots of examples historically where uh, experts have studied uh, ufo cases and they've come up with completely erroneous uh, interpretations of those things there's the famous chilean case which anybody can look up where a, a huge panel of experts couldn't figure it out uh, but what happened was that they released the data, they released the video, and then people on the internet, myself included, figured out what it was. So what I would like is for as much data as possible to be declassified. And I think that is something that is not an insurmountable thing. I don't think there's good reason for the classification of a, a large amount of this data. When something comes out like this green triangle video which was classified you know it's something that you know shouldn't have been released uh there's there's nothing that's harmful to u.s interests except perhaps a little embarrassment whether they couldn't identify stars so i think uh we should push for clarification by having the data refined in whatever way the people who have that data can can accept you know if it's scientists that's that's great but if you can release videos to the general public a lot of them are going to get solved. Some of them might turn out to be gems. Some of them might turn out to be things we can't figure out. But there's, there's, there's things that just basically aren't being done now. And part of that is because of the stigma. And so I would, you know, I'm, I'm agreeing with Eric that that is something that needs to be diminished or removed. We need to have people who have experiences uh, or have sightings or even have video or photos be able to come forward without fear of recrimination. Uh, we also, you know, just to temper that a little bit, we don't want to encourage uh, a vast amount of low quality reporting. But, you know, if there's stuff there that is significant, we shouldn't immediately dismiss it out of hand. And we should try to figure out what's going on by refining and examining uh, the existing data and any new data that comes over the next few years. Eric, can we ask the same thing of you? Sure. I, I, I would like for the invective from each side to be tempered. When I say each side, I mean if one was to split this into people who are promoters of the idea that UFOs and what's behind UFOs is something non-terrene, it's not banal, then... So that's one camp, and then the other camp is the more skeptical Michael Shermer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Perhaps even Mick West type, though I don't. I'm not going to lump you in there, Mick. I, that that side would would not inadvertently contribute to the disprisement of the other side. And I see it. I see it on both. And I like this concept of extending and well to to love thine enemy. So even even people who dislike you intensely Mick or dislike you intensely Eric or dislike me perhaps intensely then well forget about me I'm not going to advocate for myself but what I mean I I hope that people the vitriol or the cycle of it to be yeah. accelerated or intensified and it starts with tempering one's own yeah see I was I was interviewing someone named Salvatore Pius and mm -hmm. and he was 
ridiculed by Eric Davis and Hal Putoff. And I was asking him, so what do you think of, what do you make of their theories? Then he said, well, and he just looked down and he just retreated himself and he said, well, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm wrong. And I, I think that they should be investigated. And I think that their ideas are worth, are worth investigating. And I don't know why they say that about me, but but I wish them the best. Something like that. And that of all of that whole podcast, that's what's that's what stuck with me the most. I, I just well that that I think about almost daily. I I wish that we would all have a little bit more of that. I wish that in myself. Cause I'm an extremely emulous and possessive person i'm a rivalrous person i'm a hateful person so maybe this is all some way of me talking to myself and and trying to logically convince myself to not be that way well that's a hopefully there's an answer in there somewhere thank you all for coming out mick your, your podcast name please it's called uh, Tales from the Rabbit Hole. It's a little out of date, but it does have a bunch of uh, UFO episodes that might be interesting to the audience here. And Eric, what is something that you can promote? Your Twitter, your podcast? I did a guitar vi video with Mike Palmisano. But other than that, um, The Portal is the podcast. It's been quiesced recently, but I, and I think there are no UFO episodes to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. But um, look, I, I hope to be doing some things uh, with you all in the not too distant future and having to do with the issue of what is our best hope for diversifying humanity's fate beyond one single sphere. And that remains a question that I think serious people need to be talking about because it's a very thin hope but if we don't get our best people on our very thin hope then we're going to bet all of humanity on the likes of putin g and company and i think i'm increasingly just unwilling to to see that these people have enough wisdom to steward this one planet forward so stay tuned and let's try to think about the way in which this weird topic um can both derange us into thinking that extraterrestrial visitation is around the corner uh, or that we're trapped and nothing is possible. And we should probably steer a middle course where we say what is true. And if we do have a slim hope uh, for visiting beyond Mars, um, how would we approach it through science so that technology can follow? And if I had something to promote, People who are watching this, if you're interested in math and or learning a little bit more about physics, I have a crash course video on physics, which goes through several different topics. You can look through the timestamps and click through. It also goes through some tips I have for what's helped me when I go about learning mathematics and physics and different sticking points I've had where I try to clear up confusion. And it, I think it was the video on this whole channel that took the longest to produce, so I recommend you at least check it out. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Mick. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting and uh, uh, illuminating discussion. All right. Mm -hmm. So anything that, any comments, anything you'd like me to take out? Mm -hmm. I'm good. good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm great, deeply honored and well, honored is a, an understatement to be here with both of you. Thank you so for spending so much of your time. I, you didn't get to any Twitter questions. <laughs> no. Well, uh, a question I had, Mick, if you all have two more minutes, if this can even be answered in two minutes, is that there's this phrase, the vastness of space or the vastness of the universe. So given mm -hmm. that and our supposed insignificance in it, and as scientists always like to point that out masochistically, 